We're recording. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. It's June 3rd, 2024. This is a special town council meeting with the finance committee. According to open meeting law, we're allowed to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location. However, there is a quorum present in the town room now. We may do this as long as we provide alternative access, such as all of the above, which we do. Zoom by phone, a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9, and live streaming. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the June 3rd, 2024 regular town council meeting, I'm sorry, special town council meeting to order at 631. I'll call on each counselor by name as they have indicated they want to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present and then make sure you mute your mic again. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothian. Present. Counselor Ette is not here yet. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is present. Counselor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councilor Lord, just speak into the mic. Present. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councilor Walker is not here yet, but will be. Um, Councilor Hegner, please call the Finance Committee meeting to order. I call the Finance Committee to order at 6.32 p.m. We have four uh, counselors present who are on the committee. Uh, one is absent um, and no um, resident members are present. So we have a quorum. I think we're in session. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And based on that, we will decide what to do. Uh, there will be a public comment period during this public forum on capital, the capital plan. Uh, and then again at the regular council meeting. Um, with that, I'm going to um, just ask that Councillor Ete lean in and say into the mic present. Present. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Bachman, would you please give us a brief presentation on the capital improvement plan? Yes, thank you, Lynn. So this is a public forum, and which is designed to hear from the public. We're here. We hear from the public at the beginning of the process. Then the Joint Capital Planning Committee meets and makes its recommendations to the town manager. I've incorporated those recommendations in the capital improvement program you are view, reviewing tonight. And tonight's a second session, session to hear from the public based on the decisions that have been made. Next slide. The capital improvement program aligns with the town council's budget policy guidelines that you gave, me, gave to me in December of 2023. These guidelines include fund capital at 10.5%, address the repair and maintenance of current buildings and new ones so we can meet high priority needs, and continue to make progress on the town's climate goals within the existing capital budget for buildings and vehicles. Next slide. So some of the, the, the capital improvement program you have um, in front of you, the highlights is that we have $500,000 set aside to init initiate roof replacements. The way we look at our buildings is that we start at the top to replace the roof so there's no water intrusion into our buildings. That's what ca usually causes us the most problems. So we always start at the top um, to prevent that and address any kind of roof repairs that we need. At the same time, we look at the roofs as terms of whether they can support um, solar panels or not. We also have increased the spending for sustainability projects um, for, from $200,000 to $250,000. This is so we don't miss out at any put, on any potential funding opportunities that might present itself, themselves to the, during the course of the year. We have $1.9 million in borrowing for public safety equipment. This is core communications equipment that uh, the JCPC reviewed 
This includes the primary communication between our ambulances, our fire equipment, police, and, and police stations, police officers. We have $190,000 for sidewalk replacement. We have 1.3 million total, which includes state funds for, um, for road replacement. And we have $360,000 for uh, four hybrid police cruisers. And then we also have $30 million for, as uh, replacement for DPW replacement starting in FY28, just so that's identified in the budget as, as an upcoming project, but that's obviously not gonna be funded this year. I think that's my presentation. Thank you. Public comment requires that we allow time for the public to speak as long as we have spoken. We are completing our presentation at 636, so the floor will remain open as long as it needs to, but definitely will remain open for at least until 645. Uh, if you would like to make public comment at this time on regarding the capital improvement plan, that's the only thing we're taking public comment on, please raise your hand. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to make public comment on the capital improvement plan? I'm sorry, there is, and how many? One, two, okay. Uh, and at this point, I'm seeing two people in on Zoom who are in the audience. There are 17 people in the audience on Zoom. Uh, and this is again, only on the capital improvement plan. So let's begin with the people in the town room. Ben, so but let me let me begin by saying, we're going to limit your public comment to three minutes. Public comments are on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. And the council actually in this case might engage in answering questions because sometimes that arises during these public forums. Um, the first amendment broadly protects individual rights to adjust, address the government, to speak and to express themselves, including their rights to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the first amendment to the US constitution, unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of eminent lawless activity. If a, question if a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of freedom of speech. So we're going to start with the uh, people in the town room. Uh, Athena, please come up to the mic, state your name and where you live. And please note the clock on the screen. So briefly, I just want to make the suggestion. Please state your name and where you live before you get uh, Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street, Department 12. Um, so I first want to make the point that I think um, sometimes having a rigid expenditure level for capital projects um, leads to activities that are less pressing and important than, uh, than items in the regular budget. So I think, I hope the council will at all times look at whether what is included in the 10 and a half percent is truly more important than other items in the uh, the ongoing day-to-day -day budget of the of the community. Second thing is that just as a warning, I I lived through the debate and and actually did research on the proposed police, what was then deemed to be the police palace. Um, ultimately constructed to accommodate eighty plus sworn officers, which will never happen. And I would urge 
the council to be mindful of the mistakes that have been made in the past about sizing projects. And especially the police project. Oh, you think you're going to need this, that, and the other thing. And it turns out for all sorts of reasons, including the CREST program, that you're never going to need the amount of space that is being proposed. Third, um, in a particular way, I believe that the Public Works Parks and Commons Division, instead of being consolidated into one gigantic, you know, one place, some gigantic facility somewhere that has been trouble being identified, should stay where it is and be improved as, as needed because it is located literally in the middle of where most of its work takes place. And I just would, it is those kind of things, in my opinion, that, that can lead to what I would describe as the right sizing of the capital programs. Thank you for the comments. We're going to go to the audience. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. I do not support the FY25 capital improvement plan. And here are some of the reasons why. An extra half a percent, about $300,000 more of the property tax levy is allocated to this plan while operating budgets such as the schools are squeezed. That extra half a percent would almost cover what the regional school committee is requesting to stave off the worst of the teacher cuts. This plan allocates 18% of the entire 6.5 million cash capital to paying debt for the Li Jones Library expansion project. In my opinion, addressing the library is a much lower priority than replacing our public safety facilities, the fire station and the DPW, and the library project is no longer viable. The Jones Library is also getting 75% more than normal for IT equipment, $51,500, while Wildwood School can't afford to restore the much needed library paraeducator position that was cut last year. Many of the items in the FY25 list were not in last year's project projections, indicating they were not planned for. For example, demolishing the clubhouse at Hickory Ridge was not in the 10 year plan, but now it's being allocated $150,000 and replacement of the public safety radio system wasn't planned for, but now it's being allocated 900,000 this year and 1 million next year. Town investment in roads has been slashed from 1.3 million last year to just a half a million this year. Similarly, investment in sidewalks is down to less than 200,000. As a longtime advocate for a sidewalk on East Pleasant Street, it is disappointing that it is still not in the 10 year plan. There's 80,000 in here to study the HVAC system in Crocker Farm, I would argue this was done in 2020 as part of the Crocker Farm expansion study on which I served. There's also 100,000 for more planning consultants, including a parking garage study. Why do you need another downtown parking study? Lastly, a report on previously appropriated but still unspent capital funds was not provided. Departments should be required to use up or return funds that are at least three years old before being allocated more for similar purposes. Please reject the FY25 capital improvement plan and send it back to the town manager for revisions. We need a capital plan that reflects the priorities of residents and doesn't waste precious taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We're going to go back to the town room. Maria Kopicki. Thank you, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. Uh, I'd like to uh, also ask the counselors to ask for revisions to the capital improvement program. Uh, first of all, Tony mentioned the Crocker Farm study. That uh, for $40,000, we got you hundreds of pages um, of analysis, including how to deal with energy efficiency. And I hope that you'll look at that and not duplicate spending. Um, uh, I did share that with Sandy Pooler. I didn't get a response, but I hope that uh, you will go back and look again at that. Uh, for the, in the DPW lines, there's some field maintenance, which I'm happy to see uh, money being spent on maintenance, but there are a couple items that I think need to be more deeply questioned. There's a turf vacuum in there. There's also a turf spray tank. Now the turf 
spray tank. I don't know if that what they're trying to spray with, or I don't know what that is particularly. It wasn't described. Um, but certainly a turf vacuum is not going to be needed. We're going to be going with um, grass fields. So there's some money to be saved there. Um, the Munson Library, um, I remember voting in town meeting for uh, changing the, getting rid of the, the oil boiler and, and putting in air source heat pumps. And I know that Mr. LaPlante has been trying to work on this and make progress and that there's fire uh, uh, alarm issues and insulation that has to be done. But I uh, would ask that that, that is the sustainability goal. And if we could please move that up in priorities to just get that done. Let's just let's just get months and taken care of. Um, also, want to second Tony's uh, comment about not spending 1.3 million of the capital improvement plan for the Jones expansion demolition project. That um, there's no way that money is going to be spent on a demolition expansion program in fiscal year 25. So that could go, um, and. Not for nothing, but the roads only get 500k from our budget in this plan, um, and I know that 1.3 is up there that's because you got 800k from the state. Um, that's not going to get us anywhere near. We, we're we're not even treading water with that kind of amount. So we need more investment um, in roads. So uh, please, town councilors, uh, ask for revisions. Go back, take a look at this. Let's move some. Let's move some items around. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Um, we'll go back to the audience on Zoom, and I'd like to ask Jeff Hi. Lee. To, Jeff Lee to enter the room. State your name and where you live. Go ahead, Thank Jeff. You. Yep. Thank you. This is Jeff Lee. I live on Southeast Street, District Five. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Appendix A of the Capital Improvement Program for FY25, and it lists the Jones Library as being of medium importance. It lists the Central Fire Station as being of high importance, and it lists the Public Works Garage as being of high importance. This is the capital uh, inventory for the town. So I can't understand why we continue to pour so much time, energy, and money into the library project and have done nothing for more than a decade on the fire station and the DPW that are need to be replaced. Um, I'd like to see the library go back to the capital joint capital planning committee process where there has been money uh, <clears throat> planned in the past for new HVAC roof repairs and new fire suppression uh, system. That served the town well for many years and I think it can continue to help the library. Um, so. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Are there any other people in the town room? And are there any other people in the audience on Zoom who would like to make comment on during this public comment period for the capital improvement plan? Seeing none, Bob, oops, I see one more hand. Arlie, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. This is comments only on the capital improvement plan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Harley, we can. Oh, hi. I just wanted to echo what I'm hearing about the library spending. Um, I am also not in favor of the town spending any more money on the library expansion project. I'm one for repair and renovation and retrofitting the building for sustainability. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. With that, I'm going to ask uh, Bob Hegner to adjourn the Finance Committee. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Actually, I'll do the motion because it'll take care of everybody. If you'll just adjourn it, okay? Okay, then. I'm sorry. A point of order. There's also a motion on our sheet to close the public forum. Do we have to do that before we adjourn? I don't think we've ever had motions to close public forums, have we? Athena? We didn't usually do motions to adjourn the meetings, so it seemed appropriate to have a closing the public okay. forum rather than adjourning the council meeting. That's why I put it that way. 
then in that case, I'm going to call for, I'm going to make a motion to uh, conclude the public forum. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, then in that case, I'm going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. The forum's closed. I think we can also use that as the adjournment. Would that be acceptable? Or you would you still like us to have another motion to adjourn, Mandy? Cho? I mean, you're going to be opening and calling to order a completely separate meeting. So it seems logical to adjourn a meeting before you open another. Okay. I thank you. I move to adjourn the uh, public forum. Is there a second? Second. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. No, I'm adjourning the meeting. You're adjourning the finance committee. I'm adjourning the finance committee. I'm adjourning the council. And then we're going to reconvene. And since all the members of the finance committee are here as members of the council, I'm going to suggest that it's sufficient to just adjourn the council. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis. Aye. I, thank you. We're going to move right on to the council meeting. Uh, point of order. Yes. Councillor Walker is here. Thank you. I was going to bring that up. But thank you. Um, all right, we are going to now begin the regular town council meeting. And uh, again, it's still June 3rd. And we are meeting based on open meeting law with accessibility to the meeting through Zoom, phone, live broadcast, and Amherst Media. I also would like to note that there are 11 counselors in the town room tonight. I think there's 12 counselors in the, thank you. There are 12 of us here tonight. Um, and the 13th counselor is on Zoom with us. Um, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the June 3rd, 2024 regular town council meeting to order at 6.53. I'm going to call on each counselor by name again and make sure that you indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Present. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. Anna Devlin Gothi. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. And Councillor Walker. Here. And I also want to note that Councillor Walker joined us at before we concluded the last meeting. There's no chat room. There will be a general public comment period at this meeting. The order of the agenda is slightly changed. And that is the second and third items under discussion, specifically the process for filling the vacancy on the Jones Library Board of Trustees and the post retreat ranking of the town manager goals will take place after the conclusion of the action items. The other discussion items will take place before that. Um, just very quickly, the announcements for the upcoming meetings. Uh, we have a public forum on other appropriations outside the annual budget uh, next week, as well as a uh, two weeks from now, as well as a regular town council meeting. And uh, we will be holding a couple of joint meetings with the members of the Board of Library Trustees to discuss the process for filling the vacancy, the questions, et cetera. Uh, we want to make a couple of special announcements. First of all is this Saturday, no, this Sunday, June 9th, 
is Race Amity Day. It's also the basketball tournament and the Youth Hero Awards. That be all begins at 1230 at Mill River. And we invite you to join us for a full day of events. On June 13th will be the Pride Proclam Proclamation Reading. It'll be on either the front or the side of the town hall at three o'clock, depending on construction. And then at four o'clock, Justice Roderick Ireland will speak in recognition of the 20th anniversary of the state recognizing same-sex marriage. The panel will include former select person Connie Kruger, town councilor Pat DeAngelis, and Marguerite Sheehan. Um, the town will be recognizing Fire Chief Tim Nelson's retirement on Friday, June 21st at four o'clock at the Courtyard Marriott. If you're interested, you can go to the website and look at the, find the announcement and register. And finally, I'd like to call on George Ryan for a special recognition. Yeah, I thought, thank you, Lynn. I thought I would take a moment on behalf of the council and just extend our congratulations to the Amherst Regional High School girls lacrosse team and their coach, Andy McDougall, which last week took home the Western Mass Class B Championship. The seven seniors who are currently on the team um, in their freshman year did not win a single game. Um, so this is a tribute to their hard work and dedication and to their good coaching. We wish them all continued success at the upcoming Division II MIAA State Tournament. And I noticed that there was one other announcement up on the screen, and I just want to make sure we look at that. And that is the announcement that is looking at the uh, a public forum on supporting vulnerable neighbors with new housing and sheltering. And this is specifically look on Monday, June 10th at 7 in this room in the town hall. And it's to look at some of the thoughts that are the town is having and seeking your thoughts as well with regard to the new homeless shelter. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to general public comment. And if you are in the room and you wanna make general public comment, please make sure you have signed up. If you are on Zoom and you would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Athena, how many people in the room have signed up? Two, thank you. I'm seeing three people in the audience on Zoom that have signed up to make public comment. I wanna point out that there are three people in the town room in the audience, and there are 32 people on Zoom. We're going to begin with the audience in the town room. Vince O'Connor. Again, I'm going to very much state the same thing. We're gonna to stick to three minutes. You may state, whatever you'd like to, as long as it's in the jurisdiction of the town council. And as I said before, we must, we must pay attention to First Amendment rights. Please go ahead, Vince, come forward. So I'm here this evening to try to persuade the council not to waste your and our time next week discussing the manager's proposal to appoint a committee basically to take over the functions of the town and regional schools. Instead, I would ask the council to please watch the, the regional school committee discussion of this topic at last Tuesday's regional school committee meeting, that is May 28th. I encourage you to, it's about 45 minutes to an hour. And if you take the time to review it, you will understand why a discussion of this topic will be a waste of your time. Um, I was first angry when I read the manager's memos about this topic. And then I realized how absurdly ridiculous the proposal was, how transparently chauvinistic it was. And I just wondered, was there no one in this building 
who had even read or heard of Sisterhood is Powerful and looked over the makeup of both the regional school committee and the council and maybe concluded in addition to the, the substance of the, the manager's memos, uh, which was quite offensive, would, would um, not find a welcome uh, repose here. I was also feel a sense of personal insult at a proposal which transparently sought to undermine a black woman manifestly more competent than her two predecessors. Um, as a man who has worked with, loved, helped raise black women and children, I was deeply offended by the manager's proposal. It is an insult to all of us who have had this experience for him to, to say and propose that this, a committee be formed before she even took office so that the school appointees would be made by the acting superintendent, a white male, and greet her with a fait accompli of a school takeover. Um, it is deeply offensive and insulting. Listen to this regional school committee discussion and you will not, you will conclude that it is a waste of your time. Thank you for your comments. This matter. Uh, Martha Hanner, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. I'm Martha Hanner. I live in District 5 in South Amherst. I'm speaking on behalf of the Amherst League of Women Voters. The League will host a community-wide reception on Sunday, June 30th, to welcome our new Crest Director, Camille Theriac, and our new Police Chief, Gabriel Ting. We want to invite town council members and indeed all of our community to attend. It's an opportunity to meet the leaders of our public safety departments and hear their goals and aspirations will be Sunday, June 30th, Mill River Recreation Area from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. It's informal. Please come, bring the families and friends, socialize, learn more about crafts and our police department. And we will also have some new town employees that I hope we can welcome uh, at the same time. So save the date. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, come back to the room. Maria, Maria Kopicki. <clears throat> Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. Uh, I want to thank the town councilors who persevered and finally got the library project on the agenda as an actual agenda item for you guys to address. So thank you uh, for those of you who uh, succeeded in getting that to happen. Unfortunately, that did happen after the town manager made a decision to write to the MBLC to ask for an extension. Um, and I just want to say that it is still not too late to represent the people, represent your constituents. Um, we voted for you guys. We didn't vote for the town manager. And uh, I'm hoping that action will be taken. This project has gone from 36 to 46 and now to $55 million. And the value engineering that's been proposed that would cost $800,000 approximately uh, would eliminate sustainability and pretty much gut the historic integrity of the building. And it would, in trying to save money, actually lose grants. So wouldn't even get anywhere. Um, the MBLC meets this Thursday to discuss the extension. And in the memo that the town manager sent, he indicated that uh, there's an intention to sign a contract with the designers who have, in my opinion, not done such a great job. Um, and to do that signing on Friday, as early as Friday. So there's, we need to, we need to take action. Um, 
the only people that would benefit by pushing this off for another six months would be the people who are getting paychecks. That's the OPM, that's the designers, and that's the paid fundraisers. The MBLC doesn't have any risk here. They expect to get their money back. I hope that they would forgive us, but they don't have to. The risks here are all to the town, to other buildings, to operating budgets, to capital budgets. Um, and to the library itself as an asset as we delay further fixing the roof that's leaking and replacing the HVAC system. So um, I hope that we can turn things around here. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Martha, you still have your hand up and I'm not going to call on you again. So please take your hand down. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, uh, thank you, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. First, in addition to Councillor Ryan's acknowledgement of the girls lacrosse, I want to also congratulate the Amherst Regional Middle School girls who won the Massachusetts Track and Field Championship on Saturday. I'm calling in tonight to speak about the Jones Library expansion and renovation project. Despite all signs indicating the plan is not viable, as Maria's mentioned, the town manager has requested a six month extension of the MBLC's construction start date deadline. It's crazy. The Jones Library Capital Campaign has been floundering and still has been unable to remit to the town $900,000 that was due at the end of January. The designers are proposing to cut the remaining historic preservation aspects of the project in a futile attempt to reduce the cost. Similarly, the remaining nods to sustainability are on the chopping block, including what was left of the cross-laminated timber, double glazed windows and solar panels. These changes would be unpalatable to taxpayers and would likely result in the loss of grants and potential historic tax credits, which are being counted toward the library's fundraising. Estimates for design and project management to keep this project on life support through December are more than $800,000. And in six months, costs will have escalated by $1.2 million. Any reductions from another round of devastating value engineering will be consumed by design costs and escalation. And lastly, Many of the reasons cited for the single high bid will not change. It's still a tight site with no room for staging or set down of construction equipment and a narrow easement from the historic stronghouse. The project is complex with historic preservation, extensive asbestos abatement, site work, etc. It's truly wishful thinking to extend this project and expect it will all work out. If you really meant it when you said not a penny more, then please end this now, as it is all but guaranteed that the town manager would be back to you in December looking for more money. The town has already spent $2.3 million of the MBLC money on this project, and all of that will have to be paid back. Please stop the spending and pivot to addressing the most critical repairs. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Meg Gage, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm Meg Gage. I live in North Amherst on Montague Road. I won't repeat the uh, letter that I wrote to you. I wanted to make one observation and I, I briefly made it in my letter. Um, it's my observation that public opinion is changing on the question of the library. Um, and I wanted to encourage you to think about, is there some kind of community listening process or uh, survey. I don't know how to do that, but I feel we're in the process of people changing their mind or thinking differently about the project. And when we, I appreciate all the people who've spoken and who've written letters. I think we need to go a level below that and try to listen to people who maybe haven't registered their opinion yet. But it does seem to me opinion is changing on this question of the library. Thank you so much. I can't believe how long your meetings are. <laughs> and thank you for being there. So many of you in the room. Over. <laughs> thank, thanks, Meg. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Arlie, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Oh, hi again. I'm Arlie Gould. I live in South Amherst also. Um, I'm also talking about the Jones Library again. Um, the Jones Library Expansion Project has been largely state grant driven, and the town has been twisting and turning, trying to meet the requirements of the grant, and it has failed. So now the people in charge of implementing this state grant want more time, 
So they're going back to the MBLC for a six month extension. Meanwhile, the current and actual problems of the Jones continue to get worse and worse as we wait to see, and as we've been waiting for years to see if this expansion actually happens or not. So, you know, this leads me just to two things. One, please do not pay for, you know, if they get the extension, you know, for all the monies for the architects and everybody, that's not the town's responsibility to pay for this six month gamble to see if we get a bid that's low enough. And also to maybe try to bring back the options, it's, you know, the only option now is this expansion, you know, because of the state grant. If we could go back to the repair, renovation, reconfiguring the space and retrofitting for better energy and sustainability. I almost wonder if you could defund the library and start over when there's a proper plan to do a more modest historic preservation you know, project. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, that concludes public comment. And we are going to move on to the consent agenda. Before we do move on to the consent agenda, first of all, um, earlier in the day, we did pull from the consent agenda uh, the approval of minutes because they are not ready. I would also like to... Um, recognize that the motion uh, with regard to the letter to the uh, uh, state regarding support for CRESS, we're going to actually want to change that motion. And so I think at this point, the best thing is to remove that from the consent agenda. Okay. So the motion is as follows, the, um, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of resolution in support of paint stewardship legislation. Please note there was some update on some numbers related to what those numbers are with the House and Senate. 8A, approval of the use of public way farm stand at 822 East Pleasant Street. 8C, authorization of the town manager to enter or renew intergovernmental agreements. And 9A to C, approval of the following town manager appointments, Affordable Housing Trust Board of Trustees, Alex Cox for a term to expire June 30th, 2026, Board of Assessors, Alexander Neffer for a term to expire June 30th, 2027, and Finance Director, Melissa Zawadzki. Is there a second? Second. Um, and were there any hands up to remove any items? I'm sorry, I should have asked for that first. Thank you. Then we're going to go ahead and vote on this. I'm going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Uh, Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to ask Jennifer Taub to read the last few paragraphs of the resolution in support of paint stewardship legislation. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's three stanzas, so that it will be to provide a little more information rather than just the last clause. So bear with me, please. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Amherst Town Council urges the Massachusetts General Court and the leadership of both chambers to view the pending paint stewardship legislation favorably and take whatever actions are necessary to pass the paint stewardship bills into law 
including voting favorably out of any and all committees. Be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council urges the leadership of both chambers of the Massachusetts State Legislature to approve H823, an act relative to paint recycling, and S551, an act relative to paint recycling, currently within House 4263, an act to save recycling costs in the Commonwealth. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to Senator Joe Comerford, Representative Mindy Dom, House Ways and Means Committee Chair, Aaron uh, Mitzkovitz, Senate Ways and Means Committee Chair Michael Rodriguez, Speaker of the House Ron Mariano, and Senate President Karen Spilka. Thank you. And thanks to all of the sponsors that worked on that and to GOL for its review. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, presentation and discussion items. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to do discussion item A first, which is the update on the Jones Library Project, but we're going to do B and C after we get done with the action items. And actually now after we get done with the appointments as well, since we're not going to come back to appointments. So with that, I'm going to turn to the town manager uh, for remarks regarding the Jones Library Building Project. Uh, thank you, Lynn. So uh, you've heard a lot of comments on the Jones Library so far. So I just want to go back and sort of recount where we are and, and then open up you know, to listen to the conversations that the counselors would like to have. So I think there's general agreement that the Jones Library needs repair, replacement, renovation. There's certainly um, the things that have been identified that people have rec referenced, you know, the HVAC system it definitely needs in investment. And we also know that the Jones Library trustees have been deferring capital requests um, over the past few years in anticipation of a new building. So they haven't been investing in this building and that adds to the additional uh, challenges that the building has. Um, there are many people who have opposed this, the proposed changes as too much, too big, and uh, the, many people still continue to oppose it. Uh, many people have supported the, the um, proposed project and many continue. And I think, you know, some people said, well, we're starting to hear a change of mind, which um, one of the commenters said. Um, I, when I Bill, when I make decisions, I look at what the town has decided by, and how do I know what the town has decided? I see it through votes of elected bodies and the electorate. So every time this project has been before elected officials, whether it's the board of trustees, the select board, or the town council, it has been received approval. Uh, when it was presented on the ballot box, it received positive um, vote from the general public. So every step along the way, there's been approval on every, you know, even increasing the borrowing authority. The council approved that as as uh, last year. Um, we also, I also want to recognize that there have been many years. This project is in the work, been works for a decade, if not longer, um, well before my time here. And people have been working on it to build um, support and to obtain funding. And I want to recognize the work that all those folks have been putting in because you know it's a wide swath of people who have really contributed a lot to trying to uh, create a new facility for the Jones Library uh, because they love the Jones Library. And that includes our, our library director, the trustees, uh, the, um, you know, the friends of, of the Jones Library, the people who are, who are really dedicating their, their lives to developing more uh, capital to support it. Um, but what has happened is that it's taken a long time. Um, there have been challenges to this, you know, to the to the proposal. Um, there's and you know and I and there's been you know COVID nineteen happened. There's been cost escalations, and that got us to the point where you know, last year we said we want to get to the bid. We got to the bid, um, and there was one bid, and the bid was was substantially over any budget that we had. That was a problem because we didn't have an appropriation. The council has been extremely clear that its appropriation at 15.8 million is the appropriation, not to expect anything more from the council unless I hear, uh, hear something different tonight. We have looked at why the bid was over um, and some options for going forward. You know, there's a lot of, we talked to people, who, to the company that bid, we talked to companies that did not bid. Uh, there are a number of reasons for it that some people say. Some some people said that because there's one bid, it automatically um, right, raises the price. 
interestingly, the sub bids for the gen for the um, electrical, plumbing, those types HVAC, they were under budget. So it was really the general contractor budget. And I think the things that you know other people have identified um, tonight was also the site constraints, um, the uh, the asbestos, which was discovered after you know in the process of doing the bid. Um, and some other uh, in the history, the level of historic detail that needed to be addressed. There was a lot of handwork. So, you know, we've had people talk to the contractors, and you know, there are reasons. And some people say, well, just having multiple bids by in and of itself will lower the price. So, um, you know, so, so we have this project. We have funding from the town council. We have funding 15.5 million from the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. There's a million dollars from CPA. The Jones Library trustees have pledged about 13 plus million dollars. So what are the options available to us? One option is to um, stop the project and say, we don't have the funds to do what, this, what, the, what the single bid brought to us and then pivot to what do we need to do to repair the, the Jones? That's one option. A second option is to um, take the record, say, um, oh, one bid wasn't enough. The market conditions were such that a number of people didn't bid for a variety of reasons. Every company had a slightly different reason. Let's rebid in the fall. Maybe market conditions are changed. Maybe that's enough to bring the bid within, you know, closer to our budget. The third option is to make changes to the design, value engineering, sometimes people call it, and invest additional funds into redesigning the building, taking, you know, addressing the things that people have identified as being the expensive items and, and rebid in the fall in the hopes that that brings down the, the cost. So the, the, the sequence of events are like for a, pivot, it means we start, to, we, we need to get a budget together to begin the process of, of addressing the needs of the building through without this project as it has been designed. Um, the rebid is a relatively small cost. We will just, re, if we, if it's simply a rebid, some people will say that that's, you're ridiculous that you're not going to make up that margin in that amount with, with just a rebidding. And the, in the, bid, you know, with value engineering, the architect has said $800,000 at the last Jones Library Building Committee meeting. Um, there's another building committee meeting tomorrow. I anticipate that they'll have some more numbers, more detailed numbers after the discussion at last week's meeting. So, and then the second question is, suppose we move to the value engineering piece and the number is 800,000 or 300,000, whatever the number is, where does that money come from? You know, is that a, is that something that the town puts forward? Is it money that the trustees would be asked to put to to front or to pay if they were if they wanted to move the project forward? So those are the questions that we're focused on. Um, what where we are today is that we don't move forward unless the MBLC, the Mass Board of Library Commissioner, says yes, you can have an extension. Without that, yes, we can't move forward. So that's the first threshold question is. Are we able to use the MBLC money beyond the, the expiration date that we have as, as of the state? We don't know the answer. We will That, that meeting is on Thursday. Um, whether they vote that day or not, they'll make a decision at some point in time. Um, so in terms of the way I am looking at it, the, until you know the, the town the town the town has identified, um, the Jones Library is one of its four major capital projects. The council has it in its financial guidance. It has it in the town manager goals. Um, it, again, it's been in, in operate. It's been in development for over a decade. Um, the other way I look at it is that a fifteen point eight million dollar investment from the town leverages about thirty million dollars in new money from both the MBLC and um, private fundraising. If we go the repair route, there may be a a different source of, or maybe those same people will say you can still use our private fundraising. So that's an unknown, but it's been suggested that you would open up a different group of people who might want us to contribute at that point in time. So the real question as I look at it is, do we move ahead? Do we still continue to seek out um, options available to the town 
which the first option is can we can we can we have a discussion beyond Thursday when the MBLC votes or not? Or do we decide to say no, goodbye, fundraising, goodbye, um, MBLC money, we're gonna go it alone. What does that look like? So when we looked at this last year, when you asked, when you're reviewing this last year, we gave you a memo that, that said that repairs were in the $20 million range. Um, the design cost to get there in a program, you know, in a planning and things was, I suppose it's a 10% um, premium on that. So it's $2 million of design work that would have to do there to get there. And then, you know, in the process of this, most likely we still will have the cost um, of emptying the building, securing a new site for the Jones as we as we do the work. Because, you know, the the sort of the big thing that hit us this year was the asbestos that's that's in the ceilings, and so it's very difficult to do uh, remediate asbestos with people in the building. It's it's not fair to the employees, and most people do not want to participate in that. So that's where we are. Um, the Jones Library Building Committee is meeting tomorrow at five. I, uh, Pam is Pam is here five thirty something like that, um, and this will be part of that discussion as well. The action that we have taken to date has been to request the MBLC to extend. Um, that was a no cost item. It didn't cost us a dime to request that. Um, it keeps our options open, and that's why um, the letter went to the MBLC to say, "Could we use your money longer than you had previously said?" Uh, one other thing, there is inflation involved, and that's something we have to factor in as well. You know, there generally um, that kind of inflation does impact bidding, whichever project we go with, whether it's repairs or the current project. And I want to recognize that Holly Drake, our comptroller, is here. Jen LaFountain, who is a member of the building committee and also our treasurer collector, are here. If there are questions I can't answer, hopefully they can, or you can, we will get back to you. Okay. Okay, the floor is open for counselor questions. Bob Hegner. The, um, the council has been very clear that we're willing to put in the $15.8 million, but nothing more. What's your confidence that the trustees can raise the amount of money that's needed to complete the project at whatever it is, 55 million or whatever the the current tag is, price tag is? I will say the fundraisers have confidence. I'm not a fundraiser. It's hard for me to judge that. The way we have secured funding from for going into this part of the phase is that we have a memorandum of understanding that says that the trustees will, will put $1.8 million of their endowment on the line to get to this, this point. Um, and that money would be used if the, if we do not move forward, they would use that money to to re, do the repair of the building. Um, it's hard for me to judge in terms of whether they can actually raise the funds. I trust that they are professional fundraisers who have been at this for a long time. They have a, a commitment, and the Jones trustees have an endowment that can help support that. Well, I just want I want to make it very clear that. I don't feel the town can put any more than what we've we've done. And if it goes beyond that, I, I have to vote no because I can't we can't afford it. Yeah, so I don't think anybody has suggested at this point that the town put in additional funds. I, there's never I haven't heard that discussion from anybody involved with the project that they would come back and ask the town for additional funds at this at this given this this gap. Kathy. Uh, when we get past uh, questions, I also have a statement and a motion I'd like to make. But right now, Paul, I just want to build on Bob's question. When we met in December, there was a $7 million gap if the price tag for the project came in at $46 million, gap in fundraising. And we, the town, were at risk for the interest on the short-term bonds. Mm -hmm during a period of time. So although there's been a statement of no more than 15.8, that's the long-term bond, short-term bonds, um, the interest rates are coming down a little bit, but they, I was just looking at them, they're in the three and a half to 4% range. So if the project keeps going, it's the town that's at risk for that. And the trustees endowment 
is eight million. So even though they've secured it, that's their collateral. We need, we don't, so um, when you say, you know, confidence, it's, I don't think we have a document that says how much they've raised from December till now. We were, my understanding is not as much as they'd hoped for. And I believe we were told it would accelerate if we voted yes in December. I don't think that's happened unless you have other evidence. So there were, in, in other words, there's still kind of that $7 million. They need more money and they've got the big buck money. So I'm not sure why you have confidence that over the next year or so, we're not at risk for more money. That's just my question. I just, we saw the document and just so everyone knows in the joint capital planning, budget that's marked in for just 50,000 because it was unsure, but it's more, it was a lot more money than that um, in the short, the short-term interest, not the long-term interest. Okay. Am I wrong? I mean, have you no, no, actually there's, closed there's, the gap? Yeah, no, there is definitely risk involved. Okay. Yeah. I don't, there's not a doubt about that. There's risk that this is a risk assessment situation. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I was going to also sort of address what Bob Hegner asked, <clears throat> and that is that as as we, if we were to go forward and ask the designers to continue to work on this project to to take out some important chunks of the building, we are in fact spending money on their services. Um, so the the delay in in putting off this effort for the the six months or so, or up to six months, means that there is an escalation cost, could be $800,000. There's also six to $800,000 of the design fee just to get to a new bid, let's say in the fall. And I think what I, if I want, I want to clarify, if I heard the town manager ask the question, so where does this money come from and who pays for it? in response to Bob's question. We have we have a limited amount from the MVLC. If we if we pause the project, we, we do owe that back to them. Hopefully, maybe not. Um, but in any case, there isn't a sufficient amount of money in that loan right now to cover the additional costs of the time and the design costs. How do we pay for that? As you asked, who pays for that? So we can't move forward unless we have a contract with that's funded. So until there's a funding source to pay for that contract, if it's 300 or 800,000, we can't move forward without a contract to move to, to do that. Whether that money comes from the, the town or the, the trustees, I think that's the conversation. In the previously, the trustees pledged their funds to support the, the efforts moving forward. Andy? As we uh, put together additional information that we need to make a sound decision, I think that it's also important that we look at what it is going to cost for what people are dubbing um, alternative B or plan B, which is the repair option. And um, in 2020, there were two options that were costed out, uh, both involved uh, also uh, closing the library for a period of time. And one of those repair options was 16.8 and the other was $14.4 million. <clears throat> Since 2020, costs have gone up as we know. So I think that it would be um, an important piece of information that the council know what would be the cost of um, a responsible project to uh, renovate or repair the library without the expansion and foregoing the MBLC grant. Councilor Haneke. <laughs> So I was going to mention some of the same things Andy did. 
because last fall in November of 2023, our projects manager, um, I think, well, Paul sent the memo, but I think it was generated sort of by the project manager, indicated that those 14 to 16 plus million dollar projections for a repair only option had escalated to between 19.4 and $21.7 million, three and a half to 5 million more than the town's costs under the renovation project. Those estimates at those amount, and this memo was clear, did not include the expanded asbestos abatement that, abatement that the town um, and the trustees have determined through this renovation, this uh, expansion project are necessary in the current building. Um, they did not include the specialized code compliance that came into effect or comes into effect in one month from now, um, because that was not anticipated back in 2020 and prior when these estimates were originally made. Um, and nor did it include upgrading the HVAC system from a gas boiler, natural gas fossil fuel consuming boiler to something that would not consume fossil fuels. Now we do not know whether that would be more or less expensive than a natural gas boiler. Um, it has been suggested that it would be more. Some people think it would be less, we don't know. Um, but when I think about what to advise the manager to do, I cannot ignore the fact that if new bids come in at the amount that we've authorized for borrowing for an expansion and renovation project, the cost to the town will be less money than if we abandoned the project now and moved to a repair only option. And to me, when I'm thought, thinking about the fiscal responsibility of this body, we must consider what the cost to the town will be. And that's what makes this decision and any advice to the manager hard for me because 55 million, 46 million for an expansion project is up there and seems sometimes a bit crazy, but that's not what it's, costing the town. And I think we as counselors must remember and keep at the front of our mind, the cost to the town, not the cost of the overall project. Um, I was dismayed to see and hear that um, the VE that was mentioned last week at the building committee meetings would cost upwards of $800,000 to get to. And that, um, some portions that would result in new design costs were nearly identical to the estimated VE savings. It seems kind of strange to incur costs to redesign that might only save nearly the same amount of cost. Um, I abandoned those parts of the VE wholeheartedly. Um, and I just wanna clarify that some counselors have said they would be unwilling to put more town funds in. I have never said that. People have attributed some statements that our president has made as to the whole council. Um, I have always looked at the repair costs as compared to the cost to the town of the expansion project. And if the repair costs have escalated to 5 million more than the 16 million that the town is on the hook for right now, it seems as if the town could consider putting in more than 16 million for an expansion project because it would still be cheaper to the town than a repair only project. So I agree with Andy, having updated repair numbers would be good because I think, but I've, at the same time we have to spend money to get that. So we're operating with imperfect information, but that's, if it's cheaper, to the town to go forward, we should go forward. George. So I think, yes, we have imperfect information. There are also um, other actions that need to be taken by other bodies, including elected bodies like the trustees 
that we yet don't know what they're going to decide or what they're going to do. Um, we don't know what the value engineering cost is yet. Uh, I heard what Mandy heard as well at that meeting, um, but these were all preliminary numbers. They were all over the place. It is true that we will, that if they go ahead um, and want to um, rebid with some kind of value engineering, it's going to cost money and someone's going to have to pay for that. Well, we don't know how much that's going to be yet, but it, it will be something. There's no question. It won't, it won't be you know cheap, but it'll, it'll, and I don't see how the council can be asked to pay for that. Um, but we're not ready. We don't. We can't act because we don't know what they're going to do. Um, the other thing that strikes me, so I think this is premature until other bodies have made decisions and acted and made, and then we can, we have a better sense of what actually is at play. But I think overall, it, it's, it, I struggle to um, see how, I mean, if we were to stop this right now, there would be a definite cost to the town. I don't know if we have a number for that, but uh, um, if we let it go through to the, to November, um, will that number radically change? And well, again, it depends on a number of factors, but I think we've made it pretty clear that town is not planning to put any more money into this project, that whoever pays for this is going to, have, it's going to be somebody else. But if we stop it... Um, sorry, if we stop it, um, we're looking right now conservatively at what? 19 to $21 million of repair costs. That's, no, we're not. We're not looking at that. Those numbers don't not mean anything. I mean, we're looking at a substantial cost to, to repair the building if we stop this project. That falls on us. I don't understand why. Again, the question is, what are the costs going to be to us over the next six months? And maybe we can get some sense of that today or in the next few days. But um, if we wait until November. Um, Will it really cost the town that much? Will it cost the town anything? Because if that project, if the project does go through the renovation and expansion, all the money that has been put into it will achieve the goals that we've wanted, many of us have wanted. And even I think those who are reluctant about the project want in terms of making the building um, a, a suitable building. So I guess uh, one question I have for Paul, if, it, if, it's, if it's clear, is if we stop right now today, and just said, okay, we're this is we're not going to allow. We're going to ask you not to to do anything more. Don't sign any more contracts. We're we're basically put, putting an end to this. How much do we have to pay back? And how much of that is actual town money versus other people's money? Um, we would look at the contracts we have with our vendors in terms of what you know. When you terminate a contract, there's usually some provisions that I, I don't we I don't know what those are right now. Um, we would you know the library the MBLC would expect them, expect the money back that they have given us. Um, we would, of course, seek, ask there to forgive that. I think, you know, I think we went into this with good faith effort to comply with the MBLC process, uh, but that's a decision on their part, not ours, I think. Um, you know, and then we would move right to the repair option and seek an appropriation to hire a designer or a, a planner to come in and really look at the design and the staging of the work that needs to be done. It's a very complex, uh, either project is very complex. That's why it's cost so much. Um, all the issues that have been, that have people have identified in terms of uh, working in a building that has people in it. Do you relocate the people and contract for a new space? Um, working, um, you know, on a, a site that has constraints on it. All those things are real, whichever direction you go. Um, you know, there is the um, possibility and, and, you know, the advantage of doing a repair is that you could do it over time. You could do it, you know, we're going to do some every every year over time. Uh, but again, the, the time, extending anything over time, even delaying six months on going to, suppose we delay six months and then go repair, it'll be more expensive than if we started right away. I mean, there is construction inflation that goes along with anything. So these are all sort of risk factors that we have to, you know, assess. Jennifer? Uh, yes. So when the town manager was uh, gave his presentation and went through the list, the second was to rebid and see if we get closer to budget. I, I mean, we it's it's really not a matter of closer we're the, it, the bid came in 7.2 million dollars over budget even if it were to we were to reduce that by half that's 
three and a half million dollars more than we have budgeted for the pro for the project. And I don't see the council, I would speak for myself, <laughs> um, uh, author appropriating more money, plus what we spend to in the redesign phase and everything that's involved in going out to bid and plus the cost es escalation, which the owner's project manager has estimated at between 800 and 1.2 million. So the bid would really have to come in almost $8 million less for, uh, for the town to remain on budget. So I just, we can't be closer. We have to be $8 million under. And in terms of the value engineering, when I um, listened in on the uh, building committee meeting last week, they were talking about changing brick to fiber cement, the slate roof to asphalt, wood floors to linoleum, carbon uh, curtain wall windows to storefront windows, uh, getting deleting reinstatement of the historic millwork and replacing wood with steel. If we so we'll be sacrificing any chance of getting historic tax credits. They talked about making the building solar ready, but not installing the solar panels, um, not replacing the arch ceiling in the reading room, um, deleting replacement of window sashes. And I guess as the trustees president said in 2022, um, in touting the future library, he said it would be quote, one of the greenest, if not the greenest building in Amherst. And he also cited the cross laminated timber as a feature that would min minimize um, the carbon output and they they're now part of the value engineering going forward would be to have no more of the cross laminated timber so at that point you really do have a final product that's very different than what was before the voters in 2021 so that when we say we've heard from the voters i think we really have something very different in addition to how minds might be changing given how expensive the project is and um, I was also surprised to hear during the building committee meeting that there is no, between either the library or the town, no entity or group has been tasked with um, pricing out and looking at the repair option. And as uh, Paul just said, that could be done over time. I mean, I think to say it has to, I, we have to look at the overall costs and it is a lot less expensive to keep the square footage that we have and start out repairing the HVAC system and the leaking roof and maybe the you know building has to be closed while that's being done and if there's asbestos removal but it we keep we're caught up in it's going to be more expensive to do a repair because it's going to cost more than the town's 15 million it it doesn't have to if we do it over time but it will absolutely cost us more if we keep going down the road to rebidding again. We had never planned to bid this project twice and it came in so far over budget. I'm gonna to go to Councillor Walker, who's not spoken. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add a couple of things. Uh, this is very complicated and I think, I think the irony of it is that we're in this position because of deferred maintenance. And so to continue to consider deferred maintenance as our go-to option, doesn't seem like the best idea. Um, and when we're talking about the difference in cost as it goes for the renovation and expansion or new repairs, something that I'm not sure has been made clear to me is why we're operating under the assumption that the town would be responsible for all of the repair cost if the trustees are able to fundraise and provide funds for the renovation and expansion, why would they not also be able to provide funds for um, for the fixing of the building and the general maintenance? And I think that that's one way that we could significantly save money for the town is if we partner with the library on the, the maintenance and maybe making a plan to do that over time. Um, I think that that would be the most fiscally responsible option at this moment, considering I think we're also talking about this project in a vacuum as if we don't have many other fiscal responsibilities and challenges and we're making tons of other tough budget decisions right this exact moment during this exact budget cycle. Why, like this conversation doesn't make too much sense. I think it's absolutely right to say that we need to go with the cheapest option possible. Um, and it seems like we haven't actually really taken the time to look at <clears throat> what, <clears throat> excuse me, 
what just pursuing the, the maintenance of fixing priority items would be and how that could be phased in or how that could be funded. And I think we need to serious, like we should have had that laid out in front of us already at this point. And I think we're a little bit too far down the road for us to not consider this to be high, high risk. Um, so I'm really concerned. I think I'm concerned also about the possibility of continuing to defer maintenance when we know the library is in desperate need of attention and has been for quite some time. Um, and so I hope that we can make a decision that that makes sense for the town considering our fiscal realities, um, but that also moves the library forward to optimal functionality at this point. I'm going to hello, hello Lord, who's not spoken. Thank you. I'd like to first start off by saying I love the Jones Library. As a child, my mother spent many hours at the Drake, and I would be across the street at the Jones Library until they closed, and then go over to the Drake. And in, in addition, my family's used it. My daughter went there to the youth center, so I really do love the Jones Library. Having said that, I'm very concerned. I know we keep saying we're only on the hook for $15.8 but who... Who picks up the slack if the trustees cannot raise the money? Um, I understand that they're in arrears right now of 900000 I think, that they, of the proposed $2 million they were going to pay us back for July, June, January 31st. If I'm incorrect on any of this, please let me know, but this is what I'm understanding. So we're already a little bit behind 900000 a little. <laughs> um, so what happens if fundraising crashes? because people just don't have the money right now. And are we on the hook? What's gonna happen with the rest of the money? Um, also, I have been hearing a lot from my constituents because we are seeing our kids lose programming and paraeducators and other such things. And then hearing that like 7 million, or even I think I heard, I understand that it could be 800,000 to 1.2 million to extend it six months. And that's, the amount that would cover the deficit from our regional school budget. So I just wanna um, put out some questions. And then I understand like, if we don't have the historic, if we take those design elements out, we're kind of gonna lose the money we save because we won't get the historic cre credit. Or same with if we don't put the solar panels, we're saving money, but then we lose the solar tax. So as um, Councilor Walker said, it is a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of confusing things. I need to do a flow chart and a lot of post-it notes. I do wonder about repairs. I heard 20 million, but 20 million over 10 years looks a lot different than 16 million over a year or two um, while we're looking at all these other capital products projects. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to get my voice because I've heard from a lot of people and they, there's a lot of confusion about why we would continue forward. Um, thank you. I'm going to use my privilege as a counselor. Um, I feel like I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. And there's a no-win situation. It is deja vu of the elementary school building effort. And while we were lucky enough to get back into the queue with the MSBA and look forward to a beautiful new elementary school, that was only done because a couple of people, including our former school superintendent and the chair at that time, spent a lot of time convincing the MSBA to let us back in. And this council, the previous council, unanimously voted to go forward on that. And we got back in. And it's 10 years later. And meantime, those schools continued to deteriorate. But we were also penalized by MSBA. They don't fund, they would not fund another planning stage for us. We had to pay for that ourselves. They said we paid for it once, we're not gonna pay for it again. With regard to the renovation and addition option, while some see this library as a library, I've always viewed it as a community center, providing more space for our growing community needs. We've received significant state and federal money, the vast majority of which will go away. 
And once again, Amherst is seen as not being able to come to agreement. While some donors may continue to donate for repairs, based upon my own fundraising experience with the Amherst Survival Center, most will not. In my own discussions with a very experienced construction contractor said you should never bid during the summer spring crunch, otherwise called the summer slam, because that's when contractors are dealing with bidding with finishing dorms and schools that have to open in September. And they're not paying attention and they're already maxed out. By value engineering plans and bidding in the fall, can we significantly reduce the cost by close or equal to 7.5 million? I don't have a crystal ball. So now you're gonna hear the other side of this. And I wanna thank Mandy Johanneke for being very clear. It was only me. I only speak for one counselor. I said no more. What I do know is that we have a library that needs extensive repairs no matter what we look at. And I, for one, do not believe that once you open those walls to do one, you don't open them to do the next. And so while some people talk about staging this over 10 years and somehow or another that will save money, I think that is absolutely wrong because you don't open walls three times, one for plumbing, one for HVAC, and one for electricity. You open them once, you remove the asbestos, and you close them back up. We have four-year-old estimates to repair that some may say can be reduced by requesting variations for things like replacing our very small elevator. But as a town that values all residents, Saying that we do not need to make our library handicap accessible is a serious insult. The four-year-old estimate does not recognize, this was pointed out earlier, nor account for the significant asbestos in the building. I had to move my own staff out of a building for six weeks while we removed asbestos because it was too dangerous to their health and mine to stay in that building. And we will have to move our staff out. So don't think we don't have to move staff out. And then I think about the Civil War tablets. One of the town's most serious recognitions of the role black residents have played in our history. They won't have a permanent home. Right now, they're in the Bang Center and the seniors want the bank center back. So there's that issue. No matter what we say now, once we begin the discussion of how to address the serious repair needs of the library, people will want to move a wall, add a feature, or make it more consistent with sustainability guidelines. All of that will cost even more. You don't get into these conversations without somebody saying, oh, but wouldn't it be nice? So I go back to my opening comment. I don't have a clear answer. And I want a clear answer for the town and for myself. But I do not want people to leave here thinking, that repair of this facility is going to attract a lot of donated money. We don't ask donations for our schools. We don't ask for donations to redo the DPW. We don't ask for donations to redo the fire station. Why do we think that somebody wants to pay money to redo, to uh, repair our library? So I'm caught. And I honestly believe we have to look very hard at whether we're gonna pay more, we the town, to repair the library. And when we're done, we won't be happy because we didn't move this wall, because it's not sustainable and because of all the other things we wanted it to be. 
I just have to share with you, this is what keeps me awake at night, is not having an answer to all of these questions. Kathy? It's actually very nice to follow on that, Lynn, because um, first of all, I would like to agree with you that I would do it once with a repair. I wouldn't open and shut the building and open and shut it. And we had uh, the original proposal didn't make any sense if you're going to do the roof and the HVAC system and multiple other. S secondly, we don't have a really good thoughtful estimate with skilled electric engineers saying, what can we do with this building? Because we have always deferred to the expansion project. We were supposed to have that estimate a year ago, and we'll never get it unless we stop this project. And it really needs, we have amazing people in this town between um, the, the types of people that are coming into the JCA and others who can say, what do we learn already from what this architect has already done? A lot of work was done on this, on the walls, on the HVAC system. What pieces of that do we already know? We know the asbestos issue. We know how to run the duct system. So they're not starting from zero. So I think unless we stop the project, we will not have an estimate. And the hope that we get a real estimate will never happen. And then the one other thing I want to say about people talking about the total, um, Alicia asked, why is the total always all the town? The library gets to count a million dollars from our CPAC fund. All they need to do is apply again. And the window opens in September. So that's a million dollars. And if we're renovating historic Jones, and, and doing various work for the special collection. That's a million dollars. The trustees have pledged $1.8 million toward repair. That's another $1.8 million. And I think there is maybe not the total fundraising, Lynn. So the ledger has to be honest about what the total cost is and what are some other sources. We've never done that. And when you talked about the small front elevator, it's not that it's not handicap accessible. It's partially. So the architect at Kuhn Riddle, when I asked her, she said, you can go in and out with a wheelchair. You just can't swivel it. Because it's in historic Jones, you probably will be fine with that and do the other ADA pieces. So we can we should make sure there are ramps. We should make sure everything else. So that is a million dollars of a repair cost that was put in um, out of preference. So I think until we stop the project, we will not get an answer to what Andy says. The original estimate we got when I was elected was missing so many pieces and had so many questions, but none of us could focus on it because we just had to deal with voting this project through. And that's when it was 36 million. We just have never had a real thing. So unless we stop, so Paul gave us option one was stop, we're not gonna get it because no one wants to focus on it. There's always the hope for tomorrow. And so I think it is time to stop. And the very last point, I'm gonna holler raise this, $800,000 is more than double going to 6%, an additional 2% for the regional schools. It's more than the $500,000 we've got from cash for roads this year. It's a, In other words, it's a lot of money and it would, if we paid for that, wherever it would come from, it would produce a building that would disappoint so many of the people who voted on it in 2021 because it would be missing things they were assured would be part of it. We're not getting the same project that's in those brochures. So I think Paul gave us three options. I think the most prudent, the most fiscally astute recognizing this is to say stop, pivot, and really go out in a very focused way to put a team together, an excellent team, and we know some of the names, to come up with what we need to do to the building with essential repairs. So I'll just stop there because I think it's on the one side and on the other side, but I understand we just kept going down this route and I got convinced, I did vote for it in December because I, I got convinced that 46 was a right number and the trustees could raise another 7 million. Neither has turned out to be 
right. And it was the only time I voted yes for this. I voted no the first two times I got a chance to vote. So, so it's not been unanimous, and I've always been worried about the money. Not, I didn't make a judgment on the project. So I do think we'll never get a good estimate unless we stop. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I think the message has, I hope, hammered home that we are lacking a good estimate. And I wanted to uh, refute, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> What, uh, what Andy had suggested or other people have suggested that in fact it's the 16 million or the 18 million, we are talking about three primary essential items. And that is to replace the HVAC system, to repair the roof, and, and also if, if money is available to um, replace the fire uh, alarm and fire suppression system. So there are lots of things that are on the on the the to do list um, that composes the 18 million, 16 million, whatever that that number is. A year and a half ago, when I spoke to the town manager and said, "Could we have a small team to look at a what if this project doesn't go doesn't meet our bid?" Um, and I was told that that was not a good idea. I wanted that information for exactly this point in time where I would be faced with having to make a decision about incrementally spending more and more on the project to get it over the hurdle rather than and not having a, a fallback position to, to uh, come to. So I... I would support, in fact, what, what Kathy Shane just said, and that is that we need we need to look at the the few key elements that really, really must happen at the Jones Library. And I don't want to inflate it into a project of 18 million. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, I just want to um to revisit for a second what the background was on the repair option. There was first um, an analysis that was done by a company, Western Builders, that looked at just what was required um, in order to bring the repair option through to a finish and what was, and, and it was a listing of the pieces, but it didn't talk about and analyze how it would go about doing it. And it did not um, sort of sequence the project so that people would know how um, it would work because there, uh, it needed an architectural firm that manages projects to advise as to how that project would be managed. And that's where Kuhn Riddle came in and did those two estimates, um, which were two different plans for going forward. One was to do it in two pieces and one was to do it in one piece. The one piece is gonna be cheaper than the two pieces. The, as has been indicated before, the more you divide it into parts, the more costly it gets because you keep having to go back and reopen and redo things so that they were looking at what it was to manage the project in the most efficient way. Um, they were adding the reality that uh, the amount that was being invested required addressing the handicapped accessibility issues. And they included that in their analysis. Um, but you really need to go back and read that rather lengthy report from Kuhn Riddle to get a sense of what the two projects, the two options were about. Um, and of course, since then, we've learned a lot of things that Mandy has reminded us um, in addition to the asbestos. Uh, and uh, so there um, is a lot of uncertainty, but uh, as Lynn has indicated, the idea that um, it's feasible to break this into little pieces 
and do it in little pieces is just not realistic. It's going to have to be a, a fairly significant investment that's going to uh, need to be managed in a way that's most cost effective if that's what we end up doing. And uh, so I um, I think that we, we're, we're lacking information and that's why I think that it was important to have this discussion tonight because I think that per, I was hoping that the purpose of tonight's meeting is that it would do exactly what we're doing now, which is what information is needed in order to make a decision so that we can have that information before us at the point where we make that decision. Jennifer? Um, yes, I guess I first just want to respond uh, to the question is, you know, we don't ask people to give to a DPW or a fire station. I mean, a library, people don't in their day-to-day -day life go to the DPW or the fire station, but people go to the, the library. And I want to say, I love the Jones Library. Every time I drive by and I look at this charming historic building, I feel thankful I live in the town that has the Jones. I would, in previous towns that I've lived in, there have been fundraising efforts for the neighborhood library just for maintenance. The last town I lived in, you could purchase a brick. They weren't expanding the library. They weren't making, it, it was just for basic maintenance of the library. Lots of people in the community contributed. I absolutely think there will be, not everybody that's pledged for the expansion will hold to their pledge, but there, I feel confident there will be a, a lot of people in the community that would give to a repair of the Jones Library because they love the Jones. Um, and it, it just feels like as the price Con continues to increase for the overall cost of the expansion project, the MBLC grant as, and I appreciate how much time our elected officials, council president, so many people have spent in submitting the grant to the MBLC and asking them to raise it um, when prices increased um, after COVID, but it is becoming an ever smaller percentage of the whole of the project and to continue to go forward as the price increases because we don't want to let go of that funding is not, it's not feeling, it's not making sense to me. Mandy Joe, please go ahead. I want to respond to some of the comments that have been made about a slimmed down repair. Abating asbestos is not optional at all. Uh, replacing the skylight is not, and that one abating asbestos is not actually on the 19 to $20 million estimate we have. Replacing the skylight is not optional. It's leaked for 30 years. Replacing the south elevator, despite what some counselors say, should not be considered optional because suggesting that some of our residents be required to back into or out of elevators is frankly offensive because that's what you're suggesting when you say they don't have to be able to turn around once in the elevator. I don't back into or out of an elevator. I turn around so that I'm facing the direction I'm going. Those in wheelchairs or with strollers should be able to do the same thing. The MEP improvements are not optional. The structural improvements are not optional. The rest of the accessibility improvements are not optional. Maybe some of the interior improvements are, but really, if you're tripping over worn carpets, they're not optional. Councillor Walker's comment about not deferring anymore because we've deferred too long is absolutely right um, and goes directly against Jennifer's statements that we can extend out these improvements over 10 years. Well, over a length of time. As we learned from the school project, time is costly. To argue that taking more than a couple years and extending this out over a significant length of time would be cheaper to the town than doing it all at once is disingenuous. And we've got estimates that show they might not be as, act, as detailed or anything that we want, but we've got estimates that show that doing it in two phases 
if we started phase two and completed phase two in 2025 and phase phase one in 2025 and phase two in 2027 is 19.388 million at additional cost escalation of 4% and you're at 20.163 million for a one year delay. And if you do it in three phases, that's 21.7 million if you start in 2025 and end in 2029. If you add another year onto that because it might take time, you're at 22 and a half million at 4% cost escalation. To suggest we should just stop now to do that when we know if we do stop now and we go to this repair option, it will be more expensive, doesn't seem right to me. Yet I do feel like we have to find the cheapest option. But most of nearly everything that's on this repair option is not optional. It needs done to say that it doesn't or that it can wait 10 years and that those in in on in wheelchairs can just wait for their elevator for another decade and a half or a decade doesn't feel right to me either. I don't know what the answer is, but I think going forward and finding the cheapest way to get to new bidding that still gives us a very good shot of coming in with a bid under the amount that we've already authorized is somehow the best option right now. George, and then I'm gonna to go to Fred Kaby since he has not spoken yet. Lynn, I, I would let Fred Kaby speak first. Please, Councilor Ette. So I've kept silence in this conversation for quite a while and I think the view that I've gotten from some members of the community that it it's due to timidity. It actually isn't. It is because I still don't have a clear position where I stand. What we have are several options where we have no real price tag. And so when we speak about cheaper, there is no comparison to know what is cheaper than what. That being said, I think where I ultimately land will depend on the information that I have and the whatever the question that comes before the council is the motion that is. So my position is going to depend on the motion and the information that will make me be able to have a decision that I'll be comfortable with. Thank you, George. So I wanna come back to the thought there are just things we don't know tonight that we need to know before we make any kind of definitive decision. And what seems to be being proposed is a definitive decision to basically say, we're just, we're done with it. It may very well be the case that we will be done with it. And I think that will be a tragedy, but that's, we're not yet there. There are things we need to know. Who, for instance, will in fact pay for any extra costs if we go to a rebid? My understanding is, well, I, I shouldn't say what my understanding is. I don't know. I know what I hope will be the case, but we need to find out. Is the town on the hook for that? Are we gonna put money in for that? Or is that going to be covered in some other fashion? We also need to know what the re, the if they do decide first, and it's also a decision needs to be made by an elected body. You do remember that the Jones trustees are elected by the voters, and they are still meeting to make up their own minds. If we make a decision tonight in a definitive fashion, we basically are usurping their role. We at least should show them the respect of letting them make their decision and letting us know what it is. So we need to understand what they plan to do, if they plan, who who's going to have to pay for these extra costs before we make a definitive decision one way or the other. But what's being suggested, it seems tonight, is that we're gonna make a definitive decision. We don't have enough information. We also need to respect the bodies, the elected bodies that also need to meet and make their decisions. So I would suggest that any kind of 
definitive action tonight would be way, way premature. We need to know more. George, thank you. Um, early in the evening, I'm going to, I, again, I'm going to exercise my uh, role as a counselor. Um, early in the evening, Paul, or this discussion, Paul said that the uh, letter before the MBLC is a no cost risk at this point. It doesn't cost us anything to put the letter before MBLC. They can say yes or they can say no. If they say yes, that means the money's still available. That means we still hold that option. It doesn't mean that the trustees or us or any, whoever it is that has to authorize spending $800,000 to get a new estimate doesn't mean we have to spend that money. We can go back out with the same RFP. You could also suggest, as in many RFPs, that there are options that the contractor might suggest for how they would reduce the cost. That's also something I learned from my construction friend. The other thing is, at the same time, I have heard, because like many of us, evidently, we've been at trustee meetings and we've been at building committee meetings and we've been listening to what they've been saying. And they've been talking about getting an estimate for repair. And I think we need to understand and support that absolutely happen. Because one of the things that everyone here is sitting saying, what is it really going to cost to repair? So with both options of still seeing whether MSBA, uh, I'm sorry, um, MBLC will give us an extension, therefore we're not walking away from that money, at the same time strongly encouraging the body that is in charge of the library to get an estimate for repair gives us all the options that are still on the table. And I think we also have to ask ourselves as a body, what is our role? Uh, Kathy, I, I also have Councillor Walker who would like to speak. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I don't actually think we'll get a really good cost estimate unless we stop. And I think relying on the trustees to put together a really good team um, is not the only thing we should do. We should have some folks be on the team that are in the town that we pulled in on other things. But I would like to make a motion, and I don't know whether the time is right. I have two motions I sent in advance of this meeting. One is a stop motion, and the second is that we don't pay any more for design changes if we can't stop it. And I just want to say the reason I did it for tonight is we've got a, a clicking, a ticking clock, is that what we call it? That MBLC is meeting on the 6th, and the designer, the architect, has said she, it was, the, it was a she who was speaking, they would like to have a contract in place by June 10th if we're going to do design changes with, as we've heard, a pretty high price tag. We have $500,000 left of the $2.8 million that MBLC gave us. And I asked Lynn, so documents are in the packet for everyone to see that all the money we've spent so far has come off the grant. None of it has come off the $1.6 million that the trustees transferred. So we've been spending down the grant. We only have five hundred left. So my motion for tonight, I think uh, Athena has put it up, is that we recommend that the town manager rescind the request that the Massachusetts Library Commission extend the deadline for the Jones Library project and inform the MBLC that Amherst will not be moving forward with the project due to evidence from bids that the expense exceeds available financial resources. So I'd like to place that motion on the table. A motion's been made. Is there a second? I second. I second. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kathy, is there further things you would like to say to speak to the motion? 
Yes, um, as, I, as I tried to say earlier, I think until we stop hoping for the best outcome on the project, until we stop doing that, we won't get serious about a repair option. I think we have a narrow window of the next few months to really get a good team together. There's a CPA opening on September 1st for another proposal. So we should be thinking of, let's apply for that a million dollar grant for special, special projects for renovation. That's for just the Jones. And everything Mandy said about what we should be looking at, I agree with, but I want a really crackerjack team looking at it. Um, so we're not building a brand new building, but we are talking about a roof that doesn't work and internal systems that don't work. So I think the only way we're gonna get there is to stop to keep thinking we could move forward. The trustees were asked to do this more than a year ago. And I can understand why you don't wanna work on this if you think you're gonna get the larger project. So my last thing is we shouldn't be losing time on repairing this building. It's leaking on books. It's, it's got a HVAC system that's about to fail. So if we go into the fall, we could have a library that can't heat itself. I mean, it, this is not, we, we've actually waited long enough rather than doing it. So I think that is the reason I'm saying stop. So Paul said three options, one was stop. One was just go out to bid again, and one was go out to bid a bit again with changes. So the motion I want to put on the table is this one to stop. And my other motion is a fallback. Councilor Walker. Um, I think Kathy said a lot of what I was going to say, but I do think um, just in response to something that you said, Lynn, about the the request for an extension not costing us any money, and that's true, but it does come with cost implications, and I think that's that's the risk. Um, and I think, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, I I just think it's it's concerning. I think oh, uh, considering also what um, George said. I, I definitely hear the wanting to get the information. I do think having the information to make a decision is really important, but I think timing is the issue that we have here. I think it's been a significant amount of time, as Mandy Joe said, the skylight has been leaking for 30 years. That is a huge problem that we allowed that to continue for 30 years. That is absolutely insane, to be honest, um, that 30 years later, we're talking about it like we can continue to defer. Like that is absolutely ridiculous. and we can't continue to push it off. I, I just, I don't think there's any benefit here. I think we need to seriously consider the repair options. I think when the MOA came to the council last year, I was highly concerned for this exact reason. And I asked last year when the revised MOA came to the council that we can seriously consider a plan B. And to this day, we don't have any new information on a, on a second option. And so I do think, again, time is the issue. We've waited a whole year since I brought this up and we're still in the exact same position. So can we move forward with that option? Um, and so for that reason, I do support Kathy's motion because I have seen no movement, even though those concerns have been very clear for at least well over a year. Anna? <laughs> um, i got a lot of scattered notes here. So. At the end of the day, for me, looking at what we spend versus what we get and then what we will have to continue to spend is what makes this decision. I do feel that we need to know the costs and the possibility of phasing for renovation only and what are the things that are not considered that urgent and um, important kind of quadrant and how are those going to be factored into budgets for the next however many years. But Kathy, I don't buy your premise. I don't, I'd like some clarity from Paul on why this makes sense because I don't see it. Um, it feels like a weird way of backing people into a corner. And the second part of that motion is so absurd to me because without knowing part one, right? Like without extending that deadline and looking at what the actual expenses are, how are we going to say 
that we know the expenses for the the project as the one bid we received said they'd be, but we don't know the other expenses. And so I believe that these state agencies are not forgiving. I think we got lucky with the school, uh, not lucky. I think a few people put in an incredible amount of work into getting us where we got again with the schools, but we do not have the evidence in my opinion that the expenses exceed the available financial resources for each of the options being put forward because we don't know what those possible expenses are. Uh, I don't think that this motion helps us and I don't think that it moves any of the options forward. So this is a question if that's okay, Paul, is this actually helping? Why, what is actually stopping us from getting those updated numbers? I don't, I'd like to believe that it's not ill will for looking at the fiscal responsibility factor, but what would, what would Kathy's motion make happen? Paul. Um, <clears throat> what would Kathy's motion make happen? Will we would communicate, we, I'm not sure it'd be advisory to, to the, to me and the, um, trustees as to whether to um, stop the project from moving forward. Council doesn't have the authority to do that necessarily. Um, I do want to, what I want to point out is that we have had the, um, the Western Builder estimate, then we had Coon Riddle do an estimate that really was detailed and phased in two different options on phasing in repairs. That under the ESSA Council's request last November was updated by our capital projects manager. And so those numbers are in, you have those numbers. Those are in over 20 million, roughly 20 million, what he's estimated. But those, of course, that was all pre-asbestos, pre, uh, before the council approved the um, specialized energy code. So those numbers will only be higher, but you know what those numbers are for at least in 2010 dollars from Coon Riddle and then whatever our capital projects manager estimated. So I think you do have knowledge that those numbers are higher than the 15.8 million. That's a given. It's not going to be lower than 15.8 million. Um, and so if you, depends on what your decisions are. If your decisions are, um, we want to um, lowest cost option, but high risk, I would say. You know, I think it's, I think we have to be honest that this is, you know, when we go out to bid in the fall, it may not come in any lower. It may come in higher. We just don't know. There's a risk. Is it worth waiting that X number of months to do it, and then secondly, is it worth investing more in value engineering or not? And those are the questions that I've struggled with and why I thought it was important for the town to have the time from the MBLC to continue to put together people who can really look this through, but we're gonna need professional help to do it. There's not staff, we don't have staff capacity to, that, to do that. It, it means hiring an architect to really get into it. And maybe it's Kuhn Riddle, they've done some work already, I'm not sure who, but we'd have to go through a procurement process to move it forward. Um, I, I think what I've avoided, Kathy, and what is to go down two paths at the same time. And I think that that's a high cost item. And that's why we haven't said like, let's go build this thing. And also it's just from the staff's point of view, like which way are you going? Um, I think we've been pretty st uh, straightforward about training our sites on the project that has been voted. Um, and then if we pull back from that, and, and we haven't said, let's dig deeply into option B because that's not the direction we were going. And I think that that's, you know, the council can rescind the fund funding that it gave to this project. Um, and that would certainly stop the project. Yeah, Anna, did you get the answer to your question? Okay. Mandy, thank you. you. I meet Councillor Haneke. So I have to put in my typical um, procedural complaint um, <laughs> that this item is on the agenda under presentation and discussion, not action. And I think it's a real disservice to our entire town to make motions when an item is under presentation and discussion. I, I say this every time that anyone makes a motion under presentation and discussion because it does not effectively give our town's residents an idea that we might be making a binding decision. Um, 
So I object to it there. I'm not going to, at this point, use any type of privilege to stop a vote, but um, I, I, I can't not say that. Um, Over here. This motion strikes me as very hubristic. Um, we are not the trustees. We were not elected to be the library trustees, as Councillor Ryan said. The trustees should not be forced into a decision by something we do by overstepping our own authority and our own what the public entrusted us with. Um, I don't see the harm in giving some of this decision to the trustees, but this motion removes all decision-making power from the people who were elected by the same people who elected us to make those decisions, particularly decisions about whether to spend their own money to get to a further bidding, further bid, because this would take that away from them and take that option away from them. And it does not, as, as the manager just said, say anything about moving forward in any other way. The trustees can choose to or not. It doesn't, we can't force them to, we can't force them not to. I, I think this is a motion that completely oversteps what we were elected to do. Jennifer. Um, I just, I did want to just add that this motion is a recommendation. So yes, it's a motion, it's an action item, but it's not um, requiring or compelling anyone to take an action. I also um, feel that the, it's, you know, we talk about, you know, could repair be more than 15.8 million, but the other exposure we have, particularly as the price tag gets higher, but even if it doesn't, is is the fundraising and you know with all due respect to how to the efforts of the capital campaign um as the treasurer of the trustees said at a recent meeting i can't recall if it was the building committee or the trustees that the campaign would have to raise two and a half to three and a half million dollars a year to be able to borrow enough to cover the balance within the time frame so we do have an exposure we have a risk in addition to the 15.8 million that we have authorized that if the fundraising falls short, the town has taken out the loan for the 46 well, million dollars and we have to repay that. So we'll have to fill that gap. Um, and we also, I, in terms of whether we're usurping the trustees authority, I mean, the the $2.7 million first installment of the MBLC grant came to the town and the town is responsible if we don't go forward for paying that back with interest. So if we have $500,000 remaining in the account and we spend it plus some, which will, will not be, I would think not be coming from the town, would hopefully come from the library. But if we spend an additional $500,000 going out to bid in the fall, then we have the full $2.7 million with interest that the town is responsible for paying back. So it's not, so it's not just, that's where it, we, it's not that we're usurping the trustees authority, but we're the ones who are accountable for that money. Councilor Walker. Um, I just quickly wanted to add that the cost of the repairs isn't the only unknown. It is also unknown whether or not the re the expansion option will stay at the 15 million that we wanted to say that. And it seems very unlikely at this moment that either option will allow us to not spend more than we've promised at this point. Um, and so again, I think going with the option that will have us spending the least amount is the best option. And if there's any possibility of collaborating with the trustees and with community members on coming up with the lower cost of the two, I think that that is the best option. And I think that 
we can reasonably assume that that would be the repair option, that that would be just a overall smaller cost, especially considering the bid that we did receive. So I think there's a lot of unknowns here, no matter which path we take. It's not just the fixing option that is unknown, but there are things that we do know, and we do know what the bid came in as. We do know how much we wanted to spend as a council. And so if we're looking at what we can do in terms of council action, we have decisions that we can make as to how much we think we want to spend. Is this our ultimate cap? Are we not going to spend any more? And to what project are we going to contribute that to? I think we can make those two decisions. Um, and I think we should, again, in the name of time. Councilor Ryan. So Paul has, I think, made pretty clear that we actually do have a pretty good idea what the repair costs are gonna be. I mean, he gave you those numbers and he, re he referred to three different um, analyses that have been done. Now, some people have been poo-pooed that and apparently think those numbers, I don't, I don't know where that comes from, but Paul has said that we're looking at spending, if we were to stop today and go to a repair option, we would have to spend one or $2 million for design work for the repair and every estimate we've gotten and they're now four years old and whatever is is upwards of 18 19 million so we're looking at 22 million 23 million so if, if you want to i mean it'd be nice if we really did know what was the cheaper of the two options then i think the decision would be pretty clear and what we're all struggling with is that one group thinks that oh no if we do this repair option we can wiggle and, and squirm our way so it'll be cheaper than 15.8 million and that's just pure fantasy okay let's be honest because we do have numbers that suggest it's going to be and it's also left out a whole number of things that have to be like the asbestos the h the the roof etc that have to be done so that number so that number is is very very high um and if in fact this project does not go forward we're going to have a very difficult and very unpleasant period of time trying to figure out what we're going to do to repair the jones library if we wait to november and if we can be assured that the cost of waiting does not add additional cost to the town, that's a question I'd like to have answered. If that's the case, it's very, it's, who knows? There's a possibility, it's not complete, right, that this project could go forward and our, we would be on the, the hook for 15.8 million. And that money would not only bring about all the things that the repair option that we're talking about, this theoretical what wants, but also many other things that I think you and others want as well at least some of them, right? And, and so that's what I think is, is that the issue. Um, if we actually knew that we have a pretty good idea that the repair option is gonna be very expensive and it's certainly gonna be more than the 15.8 million. And what I'd like to know is if we wait until November, what guarantees, if any, can the trustees give us in terms of who's on the hook for any additional costs? Because that would be a deciding factor for me it can't be us. Um, I would like to have an answer to that. And I would like to have some answer, if possible, to backstopping. In other words, um, the capital campaign has been very successful, but it still has a ways to go. One of the reasons it has halted, at least in part right now, is because, as you can see, other things are happening. And so right now, it's not really the best time to go to donors. But up to now, it's been very, very successful. And I personally think that it will achieve its goals. But if it does not achieve its goals, what assurances, promises, can the trustees give us that they will backstop? If they just say, you know, trust us, that's not enough for us to back. So are there actually, are there things I'd like to hear from the trustees? This motion is currently on the table. Is it likely? Paul will report back to the trustees. They will look into it, and then they will go ahead and do what they're going to do. Um, but I still need things to do. Um, so I would ask, I would not have a lot of this, you know, my colleagues to uh, let us get some answers to some of these questions. And I mean, you may you know, not agree with me, but I do believe that uh, some of the time staff can figure it out, staff with these numbers of the data, all the plans to three different experts and now come down and into the field. Um, we're willing to spend $22 million. Somebody said, oh, well. Pardon me, George, would you please speak into your microphone? I'm sorry. Thank you. To suggest that somehow that will come down. It's just it's just fantastical. Thank you. Um, the town manager's raised his hand. Paul. 
Yeah, just two things. Um, cost escalation is real. Construction cost escalation is going to happen. So you can't say it won't cost more. It will cost more in the fall. Um, I mean, in terms of just those kinds of costs, it doesn't address the competitive environment argument that we that that is part of this the framing of this. Um, I think that while the council's vote is advisory, you shouldn't underestimate the power of the vote of the council because I think that information will certainly be conveyed to the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, and that will be influential to them, even though it's it, it, you know because it you speak with a very loud voice as a council. So I think that you should not underestimate what it, when you're acting tonight if you do if you do act. Kathy. Uh, jo George, I just want to speak quickly to, do we have an estimate? As Andy did the quick history of it. Way back when, Western Builders took a look at roof, HVAC, and some other in the elevator. Coon Riddle added ADA to it. That was it. And they updated, inflated. Bob Parent then inflated the inflated. So, no, we haven't gone back and really said, okay, if we wanna to go to all electric and how would we do this? How would we do solar? We didn't have federal credits for putting in different systems. We haven't done any of that work. So we have a, if you inflate the base since 2018 and you keep adding things to it, guess what? It's, it's a lot higher. And that's the reason I did this. And I understand it's advisory. Um, and just to speak to Mandy's procedural, I had signaled to the president early this week that I was gonna do a motion and I thought maybe I should ask to change it to an action, but it's because we're under a time deadline that I felt we had to not just chop talk tonight. So I, I just wanna say there was a rationale for moving this. And the last piece, Mandy, I have two or three other motions, but I didn't think we could get through more than one tonight. And they were to move, how would we move to a repair option? You know, how would we pivot? Um, so I don't think now is the time to do that. But the, the library has pledged 1.8 million toward doing going that route. So we have some money on the table to if we got serious. And as Paul said, we're not going to get serious about it as long as we're still going this way. You can't go two ways at once. And I understand that. That makes sense to me. So that was what led me to this motion. Motion is on the table. The motion's been made and seconded. We're going to move to a vote. The motion, if you vote aye, in fact, you have voted in favor of the advisory. There's a hand up, Len. I'm sorry, yes. Councilor Ette. Is it possible to put the motion back on the screen? Thank you. Thank you. And it's just motion one. Right. The motion is advisory. The motion's been made and seconded. If you will vote aye, you agree with this advisory. If you vote nay, you do not agree with this advisory. This requires a majority vote. Am I correct on that? It would be a majority present and voting. Thank you. We're going to begin the vote with um, Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Councilor Ette. No. Lynn Griesmer is a no. Councilor Haneke. No. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. No. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Motion fails. There are five in favor, I'm sorry, six in favor and seven opposed. Are we prepared to conclude this discussion? Do we move to Kathy's second motion or no? Can I put the second motion on the table? 
Sure. And the rationale of this is if we don't delay, I mean, if we get the extra time, I would like this second motion says we go out to bid with the bid documents we have right now. So we don't, as Paul said, we don't incur any additional expense other than, I guess, newspaper ads to say we're bidding again. I think the list of potential changes and the expense of those changes up to $800,000, they're something that would take so much out of the project that people voted on, solar panels, wood, the look of the building, the inside and the outside. It's, it's, it goes against the brochures and everything people were looking at, and we don't have the money. There's not enough money left in the grant. So this would be that if we move ahead, since we, the first one failed, that we just move ahead with the existing uh, do, uh, documents, that we don't enter into another contract with the architect for additional expenses for new design work. Let's put the motion on the table. Shall I read it? Please. Okay. Move that the town manager cease to pay any further expenses for the bidding phase, and we've called about the bidding phases up to the point of bidding, or enter in a new contract with the architect for additional expenses for new design work for the bidding phase of the project if the deadline is extended and there is a decision to rebid the project in the fall. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Kathy, is there anything further you would like to say about the motion? I, I think I, I don't want to be long-winded about it, so I, I just, this would avoid spending an additional amount, and it's as much as 800000 and the architect asked for that to be signed by June 10th, and the reason was, if they do the design work, they have to redo the bid, bidding documents, so it's a, it's a redo that's very time intensive. So it's removing the woodwork inside the library, it's removing the solar panels, it's doing a lot of other features, and we can put a screenshot of what was presented. So this is, don't go that route, just go out to bid with the same bid documents. So that's the hope and a prayer, that the world looks different in the fall than it did. And Lynn, I just do wanna say one thing about, was the timing wrong? They tr we tried to go out to bid, in January, but there were problems with the bid documents. Initially, the plumbing wasn't up to code. Then there was a series of questions, so we kept pulling back. So the bid took longer to get out until we had a final bid. There were a lot of addendums. So there was an attempt to go out earlier in the year. So I know the hope is that a miracle will happen in the fall and we'll get pretty near to 46 million. So this says don't do any more work, don't expend any more. I'm going to call on the uh, town manager who has his hand up. Yes, um, thank you. Um, so I have concerns because it says cease to pay any further expenses. Now we may have incurred costs, you know, in the last day or two that we have not been billed for. That means we would not be honoring the obligations that we have already taken on. So I think that that's, I think um, our comptroller could address this, but I think that that's very problematic from the town's point of view, saying that we're not going to pay any bills that we may have that have not been processed yet. Um, and so I think that that's, and I think, you know, even going out to bid, um, so it's an addition with the contract with the architect. Um, so if we had if we had to put an ad in the paper or something, that that would be okay to spend money on, I'm guessing. Um, but anyway, just the concern I know our staff have is that the, um, if you say do not pay any further expenses, it means that we anyway any bill that we get in the, between now and forever, we'll say we're not going to pay this bill. Lynn, I'm willing think, to amend think, it. I don't think that's what we're really saying. I, don't I, I can amend it to take that clause out, that the and just say the town manager shall not enter a new contract and take that whole clause out. So I see what you're saying, Paul. There's an invoice coming in, um, even though we're over what we said we would spend. That's so just take that out. So. I, I'm amending it so that we're not and um, honoring And the person bills. that seconded, are you in agreement with? Yes. Okay. The motion's been amended. We're not going to vote on the amendment. Um, I'm going to call on counselors. George Ryan. This seems way, way 
overreach, um, basically taking on the role of the trustees. Um, first of all, we have no idea what the cost is going to be. 800,000 was a number thrown out, but it was anywhere between 300 and 800. Um, so I, I don't, that number is not set. Uh, we don't know what it is. Um, we don't know what value engineering uh, possibilities they're going to consider. I don't know. Um, but this basically precludes all that. We're basically saying, if no matter what they do, um, you're not going to pay for anything except a simple rebid. That is their decision. They have a right to sit down and decide based on what they are trying to accomplish and what they see as the fiscal realities, um, whether they want to do a simple rebid, um, assuming that the MBLC goes along with allowing it, or whether they want to do something more elaborate. And then, yes, the question becomes who pays for that, and I think we need to find out. Um, but this seems to be way, way over our remit and, and getting into areas that, that are really the, the job of the trustees. Anna. My question might sound silly, so apologies in advance if it does. So if if we decided eventually to enter into a contract, would we then need to vote to rescind this motion in some way? And then my other question is, doesn't the t at what point does the town manager need to come to the council before entering into a new contract in the first place? So wouldn't we vote to authorize a new contract should one emerge or no, because we've authorized the spending as a total? the borrowing as a total right. so the town council does not have to authorize the town manager to enter into contracts actually right. only the town manager can enter into contracts right. the council can't uh, or other other staff members so it's really the town manager's authority to enter into contracts under the town charter um you know what if there if it's within the appropriation the council controls the purse strings so if there's not money available to spend money then that's that's how the that's so, how the so town council would so is this motion against the intent of the charter by trying to limit the authority of the town manager when we've already authorized the town manager to borrow the amount? I would see it as advisory. The council can certainly take advisory actions. Um, so it shouldn't read move that the town manager not enter. It should say move that the council recommend the town manager not enter. Yeah, I guess the, I could, if I may, just the question Please. I have on this is, um, what if someone says, I'll pay for the redesign? Mm -hmm. And the only person who can sign a contract is, yes, I can sign right. it. Um, I wouldn't be able to accept that gift if someone said to me, I want to give you a gift to do the redesign. I care so much about it. And I, I don't anticipate that happening. I'm just saying, but what if, what if, um, or, so, or the trustees say, we will pay for the redesign. Um, we want this to happen. Um, with if I'm following the advice of the council, I'd be like, I can't accept that. Sorry, there's no redesign allowed. Anna, did you have further comments? No, thank you. Mandy Joe. I mean Councillor Handy. Anna and Paul were going to we're getting to what I was gonna say. I'm not just concerned like Councillor Ryan is about usurping the trustees' power. I'm concerned that we're usurping the manager's power and getting and doing stuff through this motion that we are not allowed to or given the authority to do under the charter. The motion's wording is not advisory. Right. The motion's wording says the pant manager cannot enter a contract. The charter gives the manager, not the council, the authority to decide when to enter contracts. And here we are arguing whether he should or not and having to vote on a motion whether he should or not when we have no authority right. regarding contracts. Where's the next thing that we're going to say we want to take over the manager's job? Thank you. Um, I, I can't support something that in my mind violates the clauses of the charter that say the manager is responsible for purchasing all supplies for all departments and for awarding and executing procurement contracts except for those under the jurisdiction of the library trustees and i didn't read the whole clause it's clause l um, of section 3.2 this is taken over that that's not our section to do or decide I would honestly tell you that 
I would rule this out of order, uh, except I didn't want to get into a protracted debate about what's out of order at this point. Um, uh, let's continue with our discussion, but I honestly believe this this motion is out of order. Um, Councilor Ette. So what we have right now is that we are going to wait to hear back from the MBLC, and it could be yay or nay. And if it is yes, then we have about six months to seek for the bids. Um, like I had mentioned previously, my uncertainty comes from the fact that it is impossible for me right now, where I stand, to know what is cheaper than what. That was why I didn't support the previous motion. But in addition, I think if it turns out that it's yes, then we will be getting a specific number by the end of that period. My question four, I have two questions, one for um, the manager and one for Kathy, um, would be, is it possible within the six months to figure out what the cost of repairs would be? And if that is the case, who would pay for that study to take place? And then for um, Kathy, my question is, is your motion advisory? Thank you. Hello, Lord. Councilor Lord. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I had a question, which I'll try to do from memory. I, my question is, are we restricting, like town manager Balkman brought up, the ability for someone else, some other entity to pay? Are we just saying the town's sticking to our 15.8? That's what it is. But if the trustees or some other um, person wants to pay for these, I'm just curious about the clarity around the motion for that, please. So, so I would just say, I'm happy to change the words, recommend that. So and Mandy's saying we can't tell him what to do. So I can change it to, we recommend that. But that is the issue, Hala. We, we don't have another source of money right now. And I'm actually, because I saw the list, George, that they were talking about, most of those items were highly desired items in the project. So that it's not that I wouldn't, they value engineered it a lot before we got to 46 million. They cut out a lot of stuff. This starts to cut the heart out. So that's that's why I don't want to spend the additional, but I'm certainly happy to change it, recommend that um, so that we don't interfere with the town manager's right to enter contracts. Is could, this motion saying we cannot? Could we please put the motion- Get that money from a private funder or something? That's what I'm- Please put the motion up on the screen, please. And your edit at this point is? Move that the count that re recommend that. Okay. And Alicia, you seconded it? Um, yes. All right. Andy? Yeah, I am struggling about whether to exercise my authority under the charter to just say that I want to postpone the vote. And I'm not going to do it right now, but I think that I'm really bothered by this. We're just a few days away from knowing what the MBLC is going to decide, say at its next meeting. And I think that we have not given the trustees the uh, courtesy of being able to give their um, um, input regarding this particular action. And I so I think it's unnecessary to do it at this time. Um, and I'm not sure that it's a correct action to take or not even as reworded. Um, I, so I'm, but I'm gonna hold off and sort of listen to other people. Thank you, Pam. Uh, 
Councillor Walker had her hand up first. Um, okay, Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you. So I just wanted to say that my interpretation was that it was an advisory motion, so I appreciate um, the amendment, but also that my interpretation of this motion was that we don't want the town to be responsible for any of the fees. Not that we don't want if somebody else wanted to pay for it and do it. Like, I, I think this is just like, we do not want any more money from the town to go into the reconstruction or whatever else needs to happen during the extension period between now and when we go out to bid. That was my interpretation. So if that's not exactly what it says in the wording, Kathy, I'm looking to you because it's your motion and I don't want to change if that's that not was, what, what you that were intending. That was what I was trying to do. Yes. Okay. And, so and that, that's how I interpreted it. So I do understand why other people may not interpret it that way, but and, that is what I would hope the intention of this motion would be. And that is what I am in agreement with. And, and we voted on a specific project with design features. We did, and so did every voter in the town when they looked at it. Pat DeAngelis. Um, excuse me. I, for some reason, my hand went down. I'm sorry. It did go down and I didn't see it. Go ahead, please, Pam. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to point out that we, we have an MOA with the trustees and we were at the point of, uh, I think it was September 22, that we were going to cover roughly the 1.8 uh, million that was estimated to be the remainder of design fees through, through to this period. And in fact, our MOA um, does not talk about extending that period into a new, uh, uh, essentially a new phase, a, a, a post-bid, pre-bid um, thing. So so our, our MOA doesn't really allow us to be spending more money on the uh, design fees. Um, the point that somebody brought up that we should have been talking about this at a different time is a good point. Um, we, we asked for May 6th to have this on the agenda. We also asked on May 20th to have this on the agenda. This is actually the first meeting that we're actually getting to discuss it in any to any degree. Thank you. Pat DeAngelis. Um, this is uh, not a simple um, conversation for me, a discussion for me. I can feel myself moving back and forth from one position to the other. I'm very concerned about on the ongoing town budget for lots of things that we haven't even brought up tonight that this might impact. But I also feel very strongly that we are not allowing a process and other elected officials we're bypassing, because that's the intention, the trustee's decision. And I feel like I would like to hear their decision and then have a chance to react to that decision before I do something. So I'm going to exercise my right to postpone. Councilor DeAngelis has exercised her right to postpone. That is not debatable. Okay. Um, You, you can comment, but there's no more debate on the motion. Okay. okay. Okay, so I just have a question then. My comment is, if we postpone and we come back and we've entered a contract, we can't even vote on this anymore. So just that's the consequence of that. This is gone. I, we cannot debate the right to postpone. Okay, so that, that's, that's my understanding, right? That is we, correct. We don't get another chance. It's gone. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I have a question for the town manager. So it's if the trustees decide that they're going to, you know, because I've been listening to the meetings, you know, then their value, they, they have a list of what they are looking, they're asking the architect, I believe, that they can be taken out to make the project less expensive in the hopes when they go out to bid again that they'll get a lower price. Is Will that ever come to the council to, or 
basically what they can go out to bid with could look very different than what was before the voters in 2021 and there's nothing we can do about that? So, um, so we will learn tomorrow uh, when the Jones Library Board of Trustees meets with the Jones Library Building Committee to hear what they're thinking about in terms of what that all looks like. Um, yeah, I don't know. And uh, the council's role is on authorizing the appropriation and the borrowing, which you have done, uh, which is the fifteen point eight million dollars plus the, the that authorization plus the larger number, which you voted on last December, I think it was. Um, so if it's within the framework of that number, the project can move forward. Yeah, that just. This this was very, I guess, unanticipated because when we approved the increased borrowing, we thought we had a picture of what was going out to bid, and it did go out to bid, and then that bid had to be rejected, and this is just something we hadn't anticipated that we'd be going out again with a building that looks very different. Yeah. Anna, again, you're not debating the motion. Not debating the motion. Thank you. Jennifer, I hear you, but what the voters actually approved was a borrowing. It was not a picture. There was no picture on the ballot. There's no picture in the motion language. I'm looking at it right now. The way that this, and voters are are responsible for educating themselves. They ordered that the town appropriate X number for the expansion and renovation and authorized to borrow. So it's not that people voted a specific design. It was not, but there were the, yes, there were brochures. Pardon? There were brochures that went out. There were. But that's not what people I voted. Know, I know, but you People know put that. out campaign literature all the time, Jennifer. But people in good faith thought that the library was going to be a certain way. And people plenty in good Turner? faith. Yeah, Excuse thank you. Me. Counselors are thank speaking you. without being recognized. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I actually would like to suggest we have had enough conversation on this one for tonight. I'm going to suggest we take a 10 minute break and come back and finish our meeting. Please turn your mics off and your videos off. Turn your videos back on when you return. Thank you.
please turn your videos on as you come back. We're moving on to action. Uh, I'm waiting for other people to come back. Jennifer, you've got a wavy line. There you go. Yeah. Open this. I opened it. Well, I can't even look straight at anything. It's kind of like a beer. Wish it was. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ette, you are back. Kathy Shane, you're back. Anna, we're waiting for. Yeah. And have we brought Guilford into the room? Where is he? Where's Guilford? No, he's not. Did you bring Guilford in? Okay. Do you mind if I start with a motion? Okay, I'm going to assume that Anna will be with us momentarily. Um, I'm going to begin with a motion. Uh, we are now going on to action item 8B. We passed action item 8A on the consent agenda. 8B, the motion is as recommended by the Town Services and Outreach Committee to approve the modifications to the section of Heatherstone Road as proposed by the Town Manager and Superintendent of Public Works. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask um, Andy to, as chair of TSO, to give us just a brief overview from TSO and also welcome Guilford Mooring, who is here as Superintendent of Public Works. I really don't have anything to add to the written report because I think it's important know that we did go through an extensive process that involved uh, two times of public comment, the second one being in evening hours um, so solely on this topic, and uh, that um, there was consultation with um, two committees that we feel are very important, and uh, so and, and all of that is reported to the to the council already. So I think I'll just respond to questions as if they come up, but uh, I don't think there's much to add. Floor is open for questions from councilors. Kathy? I, I sent one in earlier and I believe Guilford has a response to it. I wanted to know the difference between just paving the road, not doing the media, not doing the sidewalks, not doing the many roundabouts, um, which was the original request and what's before us and just paving, not with any of the other pieces and all the other pieces. I want to know the cost difference. Guilford, are you there? Yes, you are. Thank you. Thanks Hi. for your patience with us this evening. No problem. The total cost for the work on Heatherstone is four hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars, roughly. There's a little change in there. 
Um, if we remove the sidewalk and keep the road 30 feet wide, we only save about $21,000 out of that estimate. If we narrow the road to 24 feet wide, we save about $52,000. And Gilbert, does that also include the, um, whatever you've called them, the mini roundabouts? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Anna? So I don't know if this is directed at Guilford or Paul, um, and I don't mean this as a slight to Heatherstone or its residents. What I'm trying to figure out is why Heatherstone, why now? I looked back at the pavement index that we had done admittedly a few years ago for TSO, and I was trying to see if we'd gotten through all of the, the top 10 worst roads in Amherst before we got to this. What the TSO report or the memo, I'm trying to, I'm conflating them at this point, but said was that this originated because of resident comments and requests. And I'd like to know what TSO is doing to figure out a way to treat these equitably so that we're not only addressing concerns from people who know how to navigate the system enough to complain enough to get their roads paved. I'm not saying that Heatherstone doesn't deserve this or need this, but these are all significant price tags. And I'd like to know how this was moved up to the front. It's The road was in poor condition the last time the PCI was done, but there are also roads that are in extremely poor and failing condition. So was this did we truly cycle through the list enough where this got to the top or was this, how did this get brought forward? Paul or Guilford? You want to take the first shot, Guilford? I can. Um, yeah. This was brought to the list because there were, there were quite a few people who, who made comments about it and it was, brought up that it should be repaired a little sooner than it was going to be. There are probably three or four other roads that could have been added for the same reason. Um, they will probably be on the next bid that goes out, but uh, it was moved up. And I would add, in some of the discussion, it was referenced that there. this is, the, I believe PVTA uses this as a road. The um, DPW had identified the median as being a real problem that really uh, made the road fail quicker because it shaded the road all even during winter months, so the road never really dried out. Um, and if, if you drove up the road, it did it was bad. You know, I think there's anybody who drove up would recognize that it was bad. So, can I ask a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. You just said it caused the road to fail. Was this road deemed to be in failure condition in the PCI index when it was put on this priority? When we did the index, when we did the survey, it actually was in better condition than it is now. Which makes sense. But would would it be classified now as failed? It would be in the lower. It would be in the lower end of failure. Yes. Okay. Thank you, um, Gilford. I just have to ask this question: as we looked at this road, which I am totally in support of, making sure we do it as fast as we can. It is a miserable road to drive on. Uh, but more importantly, did we look at and determine that we did not need to do anything with sewer and water while we have the road torn up? We have we have a small problem with the sewer. And while we when we actually start working on the road, that may actually become a bigger problem. Um, the water line is okay. Um, there may be, we may actually have to stop and do some sewer work before we finish paving it, but um, we don't quite know yet. Okay. I just I just know that we've kind of made a commitment that when we're going to tear up a road, we make sure we look at whether or not we have to do any sewer and water work as well. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I support uh, doing the work, especially if it's going to be within the same rough uh, cost as, as doing just the paving. Um, I had a similar question that uh, I, I still would like to see a priority list for safety, um, safety zones. And um, I remember that uh, residents 
came in a large group from Harris Street, which is up in North Amherst. And that was that was deflected. That has not been addressed yet. So uh, again, asking TSO and the DPW to um, um, lo would love some clarity on priorities for addressing these problem spots. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. It's a roll call vote. Uh, we'll begin with Councillor Ette. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Uh, Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelus. Aye. It's unanimous. Um, I didn't let, I'd like to vote. I didn't get to vote. Who did I miss? Hello. I'm sorry. Oh, don't. Excuse me. So I'm so sorry, Anna. That's okay. I thank you. It is unanimous. Thank you. When I do that rotation, I sometimes miss somebody. Okay, we are then going to move on to item 8D. Uh, I'm going to amend the way the uh, motion appeared on the motion sheet and have it say to authorize the town president to sign a letter in support of CRESS and other state budget priorities on behalf of the town council. And the reason, uh, I'm seeking a second. Second. Okay, and the reason I'm doing that is because as I put the letter out, uh, various people have said, well, don't we want to say something about UGA or don't we want to say something about other things? And so if it is acceptable to people, uh, since we do need to get this letter to Ways and Means sometime between now and the next agenda, next meeting, um, if you have other suggestions that I would then work um, to amend the letter. Councillor Haneke. Gosh, that actually concerns me. <laughs> um, um, we had a letter in our packet. I was totally prepared to vote for that. And when you said you had an amendment, I thought that amendment would just start including the two other sort of bills that were in the letter. But now you're saying it might include anything a counselor it says is a priority of the council and now I'm really concerned. So I don't think I can vote until I'm clear on what right. um, budget priorities as this motion now says, okay. the budget the council actually would be supporting. Okay. The budget priorities that are in the letter, first of all, the one about the CRESS funding, that was a direct request in a discussion with a uh, Senator Comerford that we write to do that and that we write to support that because it directly relates to us in Northampton. And that's how this letter started. Okay. And then in consultation with Jared uh, Kushner uh, in Jared Nutch. Oh my God. I'm sorry. It's late. I don't talk to him. Believe me, I don't. Jared and he Green. definitely doesn't work for Joe. Thank you. Uh, woo. Okay, take a break. Everybody breathe. I'm a really um, with Jared Friedman uh, in Senator Comerford's office. He suggested that we thank them for the Chapter 70 money and also then mention the health money because it's the only money in the budget for the Department of Health. Then Andy has asked that we add in UGA because the difference between the Senate and the House on UGA is three dollars or three versus one. Okay. And so that would definitely be the other item. Point of but order. Can you clarify what UGA is for UGA, folks? I'm sorry, it's unrestricted government aid. It's the general government aid that we get for the town itself. Thank you. Um, Thanks for reminding me on that. And Andy, was there one other one? Uh, there was one other that Senator Comerford had uh, included in her report that was her initiative in something that I thought was really very creative and that rose out of the uh, 
hearing that was held by the Ways and Means Committees in Greenfield, and that is uh, the um, creation of a commission to study Chapter 70 funding and make recommend mm -hmm. an evaluation recommendations right. regarding Chapter 70 funding. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to point out, <laughs> having uh, been involved in the process of recommending to the MMA board the resolution on um, priorities for MMA, you know, we had a whole process and I know that um, our friends at MMA are about to send a letter back to us or send a memo to all municipalities with a list of things that they think are priorities. And this would give the chair and the vice chair an opportunity to look at what the MMA um, suggested list of issues might be. Another, for example, um, that I think I brought up in my letter was rural school funding, which actually helps our regional district because two of the towns qualify so that there is rural school funding. Um, so there, I, um, it was sort of recognizing the breadth of issues. Another um, topic, um, as I think about it, uh, Guilford's probably left already, but uh, the, the transportation money for chapter 90. And uh, so I, I really would like to get the MMA input, if at all possible. Mandy Joe, Councillor Haneke. So I am concerned about authorizing this writing and sending of a letter that could potentially include additions that this council hasn't even heard about yeah. tonight when we voted. Yeah. So I am okay to authorize it if it's just the three that are already in there and the two from Andy that he just mentioned. But mm -hmm. frankly, I'm not sure I want to authorize it if you might add other stuff from MBA, um, MMA recommendations or from other counselors. I don't want to authorize it at that point because I want us to be able to really say this is what the council believes, not what one counselor wants in it. Can I also speak to that, Mandy Jo? And I actually agree with you. I actually... I'm concerned about diluting our message. The message that we that we're where we are very, very critically, singularly, along with Northampton, dependent on is the money in DPH that funds Cress. And so as much as so it's as I constructed the letter, that whole area gets at least two paragraphs, and then I kind of mention the others. Um, if you're okay with the ones that Andy's mentioned, Andy, uh, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't want to wait until the 17th to have to bring this all back because the conference committee is going to start meeting. Andy? I guess that I would uh, see if Paul has any thoughts about this because he's on the MMA board now. Um, I do think that there, you're right that there's a time limit here. And uh, I guess at some point we need to sort of balance out the uh, urgency of not letting this delay getting to the conference committee members um, against uh, the chance that we're going to leave out something that is, rec is in the end of high value to the town. And uh, so I, um, I don't know what to say. I was actually somewhat surprised that we haven't gotten the memo from MMA that we usually get that these are the list of priorities for the uh, process that we're about to enter into. Paul? Well, yeah, I think the... Um rather than a generic this is what the MMA supports having specific things that the count the town cares about like the crest funding is usually has more impact um, so um, you know I, the council can do it can go either way I don't really have a strong opinion on it and I and I'll conclude by just saying that you know personally I feel that anything that provides funding for 
K-12 education uh, and roads come out in crests. Those are the ones that I think are the highest priorities. Kathy, you have your hand up, and then I want to make sure we have an agreement on what I'm going to be including in the letter. Kathy? Um, I was just going to agree with a statement you made quickly, Lynn. I think letters that are focused have more impact than letters that have a long laundry list. So the letter I saw that I think is in the packet had a focus to it. And if there are four of the things that are moving, we should just do another letter and address them. Because I think if you do a laundry list and you actually have an emphasis on something, it gets lost. So right now it's quite focused. Um, you know, if there were a huge amount of money in chapter 70, huge, I would absolutely make it one of the one of the, the top things in the list. But we're not and and you have a nice thank you very much for going up on it. So so I'm just uh, I'd be an advocate for keeping it short. And Mandy said she'd prefer saying yes to a letter that she's seen rather than a hypothetical letter. So that that's just my, you know, wordsmithing doesn't seem necessary, but I think short is better. Anna? I don't know. I'm curious if people really think there's going to be a difference between one letter with a laundry list versus two letters. And I don't actually have a strong opinion either way. If they're sending them to the same group of people, I feel like maybe we just organize our letter. Um, but one of the key elements that I think I would I will die on the hill of should be in this letter is that group to look at chapter 70 and, and the formula. Um, I think that's something that needs to be really strongly highlighted. And part of when I read this, I was like, I think it's it's diluting our need for that, which is extremely strong. And so I would be in support of a separate letter, which specifically addresses funding for education um, through chapter 70 and, and redoing that formula. Um, but I recognize the time pressure. So I think my number one priority I would emphasize is getting that strongly highlighted in this letter. Um, is support and the need for that formula to be cracked open is, is a mild term for what I believe needs to happen to it. Um, and then if if it were possible to do a second letter focus just on that type of, of funding, but it doesn't seem like it is given the, the deadlines that you're sharing. So this is what I'm hearing. Definitely supporting Cress, thanking them for the $104 per pupil, uh huh. No, it's not. It's 104 in both houses, both house and seven. Uh, chapter 70 and the creation and urging them to create the commission, uh, the health department and UGA, and leave it at that. Acceptable? Yes, for me. Okay. Then let's move. To, uh, the motion is made and seconded, and we'll move to a vote. Okay. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelo? Aye. Anna Devlin got here? Aye. I didn't forget you. Councillor okay. Ette? Aye. Excellent. It was unanimous. Lynn, can I request that once you do? finalize the letter that you send uh, like your it says cc'd us and so i just want to make sure we'll see it absolutely. once it's done okay thank you absolutely without question thank you very much um so we are done with the action items that brings us back to the two presentation and discussion items Councilor Ate has it oh <sighs> i think i was trying to help and you took it down <laughs> what never mind it was fine oh, we're good i missed something um so um, in your packet is uh, something that should look quite familiar. It is the same process we have used to um, nominate and fill vacancies for the school committee and most recently for the housing authority. And now we have a vacancy on the Jones Library Board of Trustees. And so I've developed a timeline and it's in your packet. And so I'm looking for any comments or feedback. I will highlight that it does have a couple of meetings and because of the restraints on our time and our meetings and the restraints on the chair of the 
um, board of trustees of the library who has a hard stop right at seven uh, on Monday nights because of teaching class, uh, I'd suggested that we do our little meeting, our meetings with them at like six. Um, Mandy Jo, I need to pull up the thing so I can I, write comments. I thank you for highlighting the start of three meetings, essentially the next three, I yeah. think it is at I, 6 p.m. Um, it. Just so it's not buried in there for people and for the public. Um, two just minor things. Um, attachment C, the notice that goes out, page seven of your big thing has a paragraph at the very bottom about that a trustee might possibly serve on the BCG. I was curious whether we should add that they might possibly serve on JCPC. I know um, I'm pretty sure um, trustee Pam was not on JCPC this year. He has been on BCG, but they reorganize a lot. And so I, I think we should mention JCPC um, if we're going to call out BCG too. And then in attachment D, um, which is on the on page 10, which is the trustee description of what a trustee does. Mm -hmm. um, that mentions both BCG and JCPC. But um, uh, on the town board and committee, it also has a list of, of an audit committee. I don't think the town has an audit committee anymore. Um, and so I was curious whether we should be deleting the mention of an audit committee from that description of trustees. It's at the very bottom on town boards and very committees. Very interesting point. At page 10. Yeah. Hold on. The very last one. Although they have their own audit. Well, but this was the town board slash committee, not their okay. trustee committees. It, they had a separate list of trustee committees, and then they had a town board. Or yeah, separate. we don't have an audit committee. Yeah. It, the finance committee does that. Uh, they did add one other, they have asked to add one other thing. And let me just quickly find that because it just came in late this afternoon. Uh, and it is um, Or slow. Um, okay, they asked to add a responsibility um, in that list. And it was um, on the, they had a third bullet overwrite, uh, oversight of the Jones Library Inc.'s endowment. Okay. So I'll remove the one and add that. All right, any other comments or questions? I have to get back to the point that I can see you all. All right, thank you. I'll make sure that I send you a separate email and let you know of these different start times as well. Um, the second thing that is in your packet was something I sent last week sometime. Um, and it was the follow-up on the town manager goals and in that follow-up, um, I actually, in two of the goals, actually split them into sub-sub-goals so that, for example, in goal number A, uh, or one, which is climate action, I split it into, I split one of them into solar and then the other item that was mentioned because some people wanted to rate them separately. Um, I, are there any questions that people have now and also know that you can ask me any other questions, but I would like to have these back by next Monday. Okay. Mandy Jo. Never mind. Okay. Um, your hand is, okay. All right. Uh, Given that, we're going on to committee and liaison reports. Pam Rooney, uh, CRC. No report. Okay, Kathy Shane, Elementary School Building Committee. 
nothing from last time. We meet again um, in a few weeks. And at that point, the bid papers will either be ready or almost ready to go out for bid for the school. Great. Bob Hegner, finance. Yeah, we finished the uh, review of the town manager's budget. Uh, we will, um, we have a draft report, which I got the last piece of tonight. So uh, I won't try to get it done tonight, but I'll get it done first thing in the morning and send it out to the committee for uh, for their review. Um, the um, 